opportunities to artists who don't have finished work together. So they're actually workshopping in a festival setting to build an audience for whatever the next play is like. And we're building it as a, as a preview performance. So that's Zoe Moore um, doing a piece called Beware at the beginning of October. Can, can you speak a little bit more about how you're measuring that demand and innovation? Like how do you, if, if, if your first project is yeah. three and a half years in, in, you know, in the making, what, what was your criteria and how were you sort of measuring what demand and innovation might be in your career? Right, it's difficult to track it. It's been getting better over the, I mean, because of the SES squad have to become a little bit better with tracking numbers. Um, tracking numbers through Facebook's new tools for social marketing, which make me a little sick inside, but then also really interested in like, <laughs> 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 and boosting things and all of that. Um, it, it's been on an individual project basis so far, and things are so new, and I'd like to find a way to, to build more data. One of the things that we do at the CSPA when we go to other festivals, Fuselox Festival brought us in last year, we issued a survey to measure the impact of that festival. And some of the survey questions were, um, how did you feel today at the festival? And the responses were blue, red, yellow, magenta. So trying to measure emotion in non-traditional forms. Or, um, do, that at the airport. do they? Yeah, when you when you go through how was your security check, you know, and you can you can put colors yeah. as to how your security check went. Right, right. Yeah. So it's an interesting way to measure feedback. And we're also trying to kind of tap into did you learn something new? Did you meet someone new? Did you have a new idea? Are you likely to act on that idea? So through the CS through my CSPA hat, we're working on new ways to kind of evaluate uh -huh. things that isn't totally based on numbers or ethnicity or like uh -huh. participation of certain groups. <laughs> um, so that's one way. For my projects, we're, it's still so young, so I'm really responding to just the artists that come to me and how those particular shows are received mm -hmm. and how often those shows are able to kind of go on to another platform or another level cool. nationally and internationally. I'd love to get back to how you your artists and stuff, but on the on the building of a network or the building of a, at least a technological network, I'd like to bring in Duncan if you're still there, Duncan. Yeah, I'm still there. Yeah. So um, if, you, if you've heard about Miranda and, and the building of her uh, sort of network, it'd be great great to jump in with what you've been doing and what you're trying to do with Papa. Sure. Okay. Um, well, I'll just sorry, to sorry to interrupt, Duncan. Um, I'm Brian. I'm going to have to go right now. Sorry, okay. I'm a little bit scrunch. Um, no, no worries. Thank you. I wish you could stay longer. Thank you, sorry, I wish you could join in longer. Um, if is there going to be another? Is there going to be a recording of this? The rest of the discussion. Uh, that's going to be able to be viewed. We we hope so. As we we're we're having some technical difficulties, I think, with the live stream. But hopefully, uh, the live stream is up and running again, and we'll be recording. So I will okay, I'll great, talk great. Uh, later in the week. Okay, let me know if I can watch it later. And um, thank you very much for, uh, for for letting me participate. And if there's if there's any way to share out some of the email addresses in case we can uh, put some more questions out to any of the participants. Sure. Can send that out. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Um, so, so this is Duncan Jamison, and Duncan, together with his uh, with his partner Adela Corzina, is creating a, a company called Tapak. And do you want to just explain briefly what that is, Duncan? Sure, absolutely. Okay, I'll just talk for a couple of minutes and give a very basic overview of the various threads that we're working on, and then I'll try I'll try and show a few materials and screenshots that are related to these through Google Plus if that actually works. Great. Um, so uh, just to give a summary, last year my, uh, my partner Adela Kashni and I set up uh, TAPAC, which stands for Theatre and Performance Across Cultures, um, and that's an Anglo-Polish Anglo non-profit organization that, that brings together a series of projects we were already working on for several years. And the company's core aim is essentially to support and to promote uh, intercultural communication and exchanges of perspectives in the fields of theatre, drama, and performance. Um, our company model is something that's still evolving, but at the moment it's focused around an, an online platform that's just about to launch. Um, so we're not currently producing performance work, although that was our initial background, but rather we're working to create a community hub that, that aims to help practitioners and researchers network directly with each other, even if they work primarily in different languages. Um, so I'll just talk a bit more about this cross-cultural and multi multilingual networking through, uh, through the lens of a couple of projects that we're working on. Um, the first is called uh, Polish Theatre Perspectives, or BTP for short. 
Um, this is a project that's mainly in English, but there are some bilingual and some Polish components. And its purpose is to bring together Polish and internationally based artists and researchers um, in investigating a range of theatre and performance practices. Um, ETB was delayed for quite a while due to some uh, general problems at the original institutional sponsor, but it's actually not launching next month. So in about three weeks in mid-October, there will be uh, a new open access peer reviewed journal, um, a set of companion books, audio, visual and documents collections, um, and they will all be published in English. Um, and they'll be available online and in print. Um, and so from, from the launch in a, in a couple of weeks, there'll be a mix of interviews, articles, photographic essays, working notes, scripts, and film documentation. And we've tried to work really closely with practitioners in Poland to, to produce those as well as with, uh, with academics who are being translated for the first time. Um, and the first titles cover contemporary directing, performing, and devising in Poland uh, with a focus on, on practitioners like Krzysztof Wielikowski, uh, Christian Lupa and several companies from the Gajanisa diaspora. Those are some things we're covering in the first uh, first few issues. Um, so all this will be on, on uh, online next month, and you'll be able to get it at uh, ptpjournal.org. Um, so that's my shameless plug for that. Um, and then the the second and our main project um, is what Brian was referring to, and that's the 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 theatre performance across cultures network or, or the TAPAC network. Um, that's a much broader initiative and, and that's really our focus in terms of development from uh, as of about a year and a half ago right through to 2015 because we're working through a, a series of, of, of online modules for that that kind of will bring increased functionality as the, after the beta version launches later this year. So this, this network is, is both an e-publishing platform um, for, for us, for B2B and for, uh, and for other independent or non-profit publishers. Um, and it's also a multilingual community hub. Um, so some of the features are that it enables users to, to curate uh, personal and organizational profiles online which, which are shared within the network and, uh, and publicly so they'll be visible by Google searches and so on. Um, and we've got, uh, we've got some graphic designers that we know to help with the design so that it's really beautifully produced and will enable, and we hope that it will be like a showcase for, for companies working in various languages. Um, you will also be able to tag the, tag the profiles quite extensively um, and it uses, they use a, a set of control vocabularies available in different languages so that key, many key elements of the work are, uh, can be understood in the range of languages and they use specialist translation rather than like automated translation Google Translate and so on. Um, you can upload, uh, upload projects that you're working on so details of performances and technical information about performances so that they can be Potentially scouted by uh, by producers and so on. Like my my brother works as a producer at the Barbican, and one of the things that he does is 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 kind of uh, use such use particular particular networks and channels to try to find uh, find new work and so on. So that's that's something else that I'm adding. Um, and there'll be a there's a discussion hub where you can participate in discussions and have uh, have posts translated in context as well by by the community. Um, and uh, you'll also be able to share resources on teaching, training and research and several other features. Um, basically this project comes, comes from quite a strong, a strong desire from us and from many of our colleagues that we've been working with over the last few years to be able to interact directly with colleagues from different regions. Um, and it also comes out of our experience of working on, on ETP as a publishing series um, and all of the specific situations of cross-cultural exchange that came up in our, in our work and we wanted to try to find a way to practically address them. So a lot of the resources that we've been building while, while, while creating the journal, we're, we're going to make available uh, for free on the site. Um, so things like uh, databases of photographers and filmmakers, um, because there's uh, uh, one of the things that we built up was uh, uh, when we're working to create uh, kind of film publications and so on, there's a huge amount of films of Polish theatre work that have been created in Poland over the last decade or so, professionally produced with English subtitles. Um, because they, they they normally send us showcases to uh, showcase reels to to theatres abroad to try and uh, get this Polish work abroad, um, but they're actually available uh, if someone wants to make them available. So um, we're including a database of all these kinds of things on the site so that you can explore. Uh, kind of uh, you know if you're creating your own publication, you can start looking for photos and this kind of thing. Um, the network is specifically optimized for theatre and performance, so it's got some very advanced translation features that we believe are being made available for the first time on any platform in, in academia, in culture, and the humanities. Um, so, so we're assured by we have a number of tech partners, including uh, uh, some digital humanities institutes in the UK, um, so they're quite excited about the cross-cultural aspects of it. So there'll be various different ways that users can communicate with their peers internationally. 
Um, in terms of uh, the organization, in terms of structure and funding, we're working with several partners and sponsors. Um, so that includes Richard Goff in the Center for Performance Research in Wales, uh, the Grotowski Institute, where we've been working on and off for a while, uh, Rose Brickford College uh, Drama School in London, um, and the Polish National Theatre Institute in Warsaw, um, in a kind of consortium to make available the widest range of free resources that we can. Um, we're supporting this with individual funding programs and partnerships, but we're also supporting it through unpaid work and, and by making available for purchase certain electronic and print publications. So I guess it's what we generally call a, a freemium, model, freemium model, where there's as much free content uh, and activity as we can make available, um, and that's supported by revenues from the premium content, like certain films and so on that we need to get professionally produced. And, um, and so that, that will help us be less dependent on external institutions. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm just going to interrupt you real quick. As, um, uh, it's really, it's, it's really, uh, it's an amazing model. And I just want to make it clear to like one of the things that I think the teapot's about, but also it is is a way to bring people together to, to 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 get to know each other, and that's kind of what this this session is about. Why we're having yeah. so many kind of presentations mm -hmm. happening. But what's really amazing about mm -hmm. uh, what Duncan and Adele are creating with this online. Um, version is, is the ways in which our access to people and to, and to uh, knowledge and practitioners is really developing via the web. So, so Miranda's talking about you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, tension between love and hate relationship with Facebook data. And I know Kate earlier was mentioning the love and hate of Google, uh, but Google's allowing us to, to, to work this better than other than Skype or other things at the moment, yeah? Um, and I know that and I know that, that for, for me, I was able to go to Poland and, and go to the Grotowski Institute because of finding out about these things online. Um, and, I, and I think yeah. you were able to go and visit Kate because of yeah. being able to I get emails so from, from the Institute and being able to meet online. And so this kind of global, you know, we talk about it a lot, obviously, in, in our world now, but I just want to remind us how much it does really influence our everyday practice today and the ways in which we're able to get together in rooms and share. Um, and so, so it's, 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 it's quite an amazing uh, 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 organization that, that, that Duncan is, and Adele are going to be putting live very, very soon. What is it, about six months? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, the, the first part of it is launching in three weeks, the publishing platform, and then we gradually, by the end of this year, the networking module will be on there, and then that will be bilingual, it'll English and Polish, um, fully bilingual in the beta version, and then Spanish and Portuguese are going to be added through next year. Um, so if you keep an eye on this, if you keep an eye on btbjournal.org and uh, platpacknetwork.org, then there'll be news about that kind of as of next month. Um, but we'll be kind of testing. We, we, you know, we, we'd like to get as much user feedback as possible. So um, if anyone wants to, you know, sign in and try it, then that would be great. Um, like so far, we've been, we've been, we've been talking to a lot of, uh, a lot of fits practitioners and researchers and producers and so on to try and get a sense of, of user requirements and where those where those things meet. And also, like, like Brian said, in terms of uh, facilitating contact, one of the one of the key things the platform does is is, is uh, tries to do that directly to facilitate um, like animative exchanges between people. So one of the features is that when you when you search for uh, when you do a search on the site for for different work or profiles or this kind of thing, you can immediately filter it by your working languages. Because one of the things that we noticed when we were editing the journal is a lot of the time, there were, just to give an example, there was an American researcher that was trying to access uh, and get contact to, uh, with a specialist in Russian theatre in Warsaw. And uh, they thought they needed to find a translator to do that, and they couldn't find anyone suitable. But actually, it turned out when they got speaking, they both they, they had Spanish as a third language. So they would have been able to contact each other directly through that. And so one of the things that the network does is it highlights your working languages and you're immediately able to kind of filter, filter, filter down to what you can add. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, with, I'm just going to add in another Jeez. voice here um, on the notion of feedback that you brought up a couple times, and obviously that Miranda's trying to get with feedback on, on, on demand and innovation, is, um, is a full spirit company from San Francisco. We have Ben Yalom and, and uh, Deborah um, here who are going to talk about their feedback model. Um, and that they've been working on is a very different voice with their uh, most recent, last few performances, correct? Yeah, well, here's what I would say. Um, first of all, it's really this fascinating, fascinating conversation. What we've got to talk about is, is really a, a different year, a different shift. Sure. So, oh, it's not. It's, I mean, 
Yes. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's all, it's all the same. But, but so changing gears a little bit. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of context for this last, most recent series, and then the board is going to go into detail about what we're talking about for feedback. Um, but just for some context, so we run Tools Theory Theater. We're an ensemble that's been around 15 years, physically oriented, deeply rooted in viewpoints, both from the Bogart School and the Overly School, um, Suzuki coming through City Company, uh, some Gretowski work coming through Steve Wong. Um, and essentially what we've done is sort of a prolonged workshop model, which is over the last 14 years, bringing in master teachers from all these places to train us and to open up to the community. Um, we would love to have a more centered ongoing practice and we continually try to push that agenda forward. Um, but one of the things we do for the field, with the field, is we have a festival every two, three years called Fury Factory, which is specifically focused on ensemble theater. Uh, based in San Francisco, a series of theaters that we rent, borrow, and use with in the theater Arturo complex. Uh, so for, you know, there are now four venues in that space. We can get hold of all of them for a brief period of time and sort of explode with the stuff. Uh, so, oops. Yesterday there were people in the room Perform there, you perform there. Oh, that was in theater for a year. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 Brian and Ollie just crashed the festival, basically. So we had an application process. We were done. We were programmed. And they contacted us before coming to your festival. We're going to have to so. <laughs> We can either do it in the lobby or you can put it on stage, but, which was fantastic. Okay. Um, but one of the questions that has always been coming up through this festival is how do we contextualize it for the audience? How do we engage an audience in conversation about it? And then how? Do we, as a whole bunch of artists who come from all around the world, all around the country, be in the same place for a couple of weeks, how do we actually discuss the work and give each other feedback? Uh, because I think it's, it's uh, endemic in the larger theater world that we sort of see things and we all kind of be with our friends and say we thought of it. Uh, and the dialogue, the ensemble world tends to be a lot better with that, but there's still, it's very challenging to figure out how do we have honest dialogue about the work that's useful. Uh, One second, Ben. Uh, can you guys virtually hear Ben? Is he, is he loud enough? It, it's a bit garbled. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a little bit better, yeah. Well, I lisp a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> uh, so, specifically, what, what came out of our, our festival in 2011 um, was a number of questions. One thing about the festival is that we do main stage shows, and we always have a lot of work in progress for it. So I'm excited to hear, to, to talk to Miranda about that as well. But, but so about half of the... Is it Miranda? Miranda. Miranda. Did you say Miranda or Miranda? Miranda. Oh, <laughs> uh, so about half of the works that are shown, or about half of the evenings are dedicated to works in progress, and we'll have different companies on the same bill showing their works and having conversations about it. And over the years, we found out that that's a lot of the most exciting work and most, a lot of the buzz around the festival comes from that. It certainly carries the same amount of weight and energy that the main stage shows do. So 2013, this year, we, one, just didn't have the funding to put on a full-scale festival. And we thought, what's the most important thing we can do to continue the momentum and to reach out and help the community? And Deborah has been telling, saying for years, like, would you just show me 10 minutes of great work? Show me 10 minutes of something great. Uh, so we decided what we would do was host a series, create a series that was specifically about works in progress. Uh, we called it Factory Parts, uh, with the hopeful intent that some of these shows might make it into the Fury Factory, or not, but there, there's certainly a possible pathway there. Uh, and we just focused on works in progress. We had 10 companies over a two-week period in July. and. Instead of just making it a, 
hey, we're going to give you some space in a theater, come and show us your stuff, and then you know, we can have audience feedback session afterwards. Uh, we wanted to, to think about what the framework was and make it a little bit more useful. And I know that we haven't found the answer, if there is an answer, but uh, some of the components that we put in place this year, I think were very helpful. One of the, the key things, and Deborah's going to talk about the feedback specifically, uh, but one of the things that we required was that any participating company be committed to being engaged in the feedback process. So uh, specifically, everybody had to go to the other shows, and at the, uh, at the end, there's a round table of all the companies, and you, you had to commit to being present at that round table for the conversation. Uh, which, yeah, but Deborah will talk about, the, talk about the results of that. I just want to, before I jump in, just two things to, to add. One is uh, the other extension of this factory parts development program is we got a bit of grant money from a local foundation in Oakland called the Rainin Foundation. Great. Uh, to help take some of those works and continue their development. Possibly, again, going towards the period record, possibly not. But to, to see, so we selected the works, A, that we were most interested in aesthetically, the questions they were asking, but also the ones that we, we felt would benefit most from the resources we had to provide, which are small, but some. Some of these companies already sort of had those resources in play. So just trying to think about how do we take something along, um, even if it's not one of our artistic projects. Uh, and the second thing is Fury Factory is happening in July 2014. Applications will be online at fullspirit.org next week. <laughs> Please come. So that contextualizes why we do Fury Factory, this festival of ensemble theater. One of the things we've been talking about, many many of us have been talking about, is um, being in relationship, being in relationship with each other as peers, being in relationship with our audience, um, and that's really what uh, we, why we created the Factory Parts Work in Progress series, um, and what we, what we were interested. In. One is. We recognize with the recessions that we were having um, and the, the funding, our belt being tightening over and over again over the last few years, the thing to do is to reach out horizontally and grab your mates and raise everybody up. You know, John was talking about this yesterday. Uh, it really is the only way we've been surviving in San Francisco. And now we're flourishing more, but this really has affected our work. It's affected how we make work. And, um, you know, those of us who, who who can who focus primarily as being ensemble ensemble members of a company or in a group? Um, we have this tremendous resource of creativity and and uh, way of resiliency. And so the way that we responded was many ways, but one way was, as I said, working uh, horizontally and making everyone's work better and exposing the San Francisco Bay Area audiences to more work at once so that they understand a little bit more about what we are doing. And it kind of ups the ante and the education um, for everyone. Um, and that's what's so exciting about the Works in Progress series. The other thing is just people need more places to create work, as we've all been saying. That's what's happening in O'Brien, that's what's happening in Grotowski, that's what's you know, happening here. So um, that's what we're, we're doing. We're giving, giving people the venue, say, just come up with 10 minutes. We know you've got that idea. You haven't had the ability to do it. We're, the, it was a co-producerial model, so that means it's it's they're putting in a little money, we're putting in a little money, and hopefully nobody's going to lose anything. So that's a pretty good place to kind of go and say, okay, we can all kind of get out of this without losing too much uh, skin off our nose. And um, and then we gain so much. We gain the community, we gain relationships, and um, and the networking. So. Um, well, the thing that I want to talk about specifically was a three-tiered feedback model that we created um, to characterize the participation in factory parts, um, which involved peer review. So we had a peer review form, and I can pass that around actually, um, that, that um, we, we, create, we had a panel of a couple of other folks who were interested in this um, feedback, and, and they're very simple, accessible questions. But one thing I want to um, uh, propagate, support, is create is that we become our own critics. Because we need more critics, and we need, uh, so I think that we should be our, we are our own best critics for ensemble theater. We know it best. And so often, 
critics are, you know, they, they don't know how to characterize what we're doing, they don't know how to define what we're doing, and we want to do, um, we had a lot of critics involved in this process from beginning to end um, of our, our two-week process of the factory parts, but then also to encourage each of us to be critics. So everybody, at least one person in every company, and there were 10 from all over the nation, were required to review the two other programs. There were three programs. So you literally ended up with a packet from your peers of what they thought. Okay, so that was and one. And just add one element to that, which is, this was a choice of the what the mechanism for that feedback was, and what you could use a different mechanism if you wanted to. But the, 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 one of the key things about this mechanism, which is written feedback, was um, sort of borrowing from a writing workshop model, which is to say, um, we don't want to sit and have a conversation and you can tell me what you liked and didn't like, even, you know, even within the structure of like, oh, there's a normal feedback model or something. It's like, here, you just write. Tell me what you actually think. Like, more people to put their names on it? Or Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so, you so know, I'm very transparent. Yeah. yeah, so I'm going to tell you what I think, and here it is, and you don't have to respond. You can just go take it and maybe it's good Yeah, and, and I'll probably never have a conversation with you about that. It's just, here's my gift to you, you know? And with that, with that, with that, you know, humble gift being given. Yeah? And so, um, and then it also requires everybody to see everybody's stuff. That's good, you know? Um, and then um, when we do it again, which I think we will, you know, I, and if you are interested in that, and please, for any of that, if you're interested, just let me know and I can tell you very specific stuff. But um, the online form was good too. We had so much paper, I, you know, it seems seems funny in, in the aftermath. Why don't we just also have that online? Anyway, so that's one recommendation if you're interested in making it accessible. Um, the second uh, tier was the audience response, normally talk, known as the talk back, but I wanted to rename it as an audience response. I'm very interested in the audience uh, and um, performer responsibility to each other. If we have one, what is it? Um, we had a conversation about that yesterday that was very fruitful. This audience response happened on the third night. There were three nights, so the final night of your work in progress when you felt maybe that you had a little, had it under your belt a little better, and were ready to, uh, you know, um, face your your audience. The other the other part about this that was so um, fulfilling was that we uh, paired with the LMDA, which is the literary managers and drama Turks association. So there was an opportunity for every work in progress and development, whether it's 10 minutes or 40 minutes or 30 minutes, and to to pair with the dramaturg, come to your rehearsals, shape it, shape that conversation in any way you like, and then that dramaturg led your audience response session. And the audience response session, because we had three or four performances, was only 10 minutes. And let me tell you something, that 10 minutes was so charged. People got really excited about participating. And it was timed very clearly. And because it was led by a dramaturg who was fresh into the mix, who arrived on stage, it had like a freshness and an energy that really, really invited people to participate. Because we all know what it's like when we, we just hear the you know, pin drop and you know, we kind of so um, the other thing that we did is structuring it. We made the time very clear. We led it by the dramaturg, and then we also the first thing we had everybody do was simply popcorn their ideas and impressions. So removing the idea of value, what's good, what's bad, anything like that, and just coming up with impressions. So people are just generated to start uh, articulating verbally, you know, what they saw, you know. I was impressed when the lights went out at that moment. Then we scream, whatever it was. People can start to say, say things. And then the dramaturg took it over. The, so that was the second tier of the feedback model. The third was the round table discussion, which um, as Ben mentioned was required. Um, we made it a requirement and that was great because then we had everybody represented at the end of a two-week process. Um, and we had um, a three-hour session together with the idea of, and I'll just um, just say our goals and actions really 
quickly for you. To build and engage the community, to reflect on the performance series and give feedback for future festivals, to grow as artists through peer feedback and reflection, and our actions to share thoughts and ideas generously, to hold each other to the high standards we set for ourselves, to honor each other's work by speaking frankly, to articulate what's working and what isn't, to model and actively seek the sort of discussions that we most want to have, and to take responsibility for our own experience. Now this engendered a, uh, uh, it, it characterized the work by opening it up this way and it really made people feel uh, that they could share and honest and it also, other notes were added to this, you know, um, and it was amended even on that day. So it became a very democratic way to, you know, we were talking about yesterday, to actually agree on the process before the process begins. Mm -hmm. And there's a, an empowerment in the room that, that occurs with that. Um, and then the process, and I can email this to people later, is, uh, was a, a process of my solo experience of factory parts, this performance series, be, be I uh, only, uh, maybe I was a dramaturg, maybe I was a director, maybe I just um, am a critic, maybe I was a performer. So what was my perform my experience? And we had exercises that would sort of slough the value of all that stuff that we carried around with us. And then duo communication, uh, four person communication, eight person communication, and then group communication. So the whole thing unfolds from the, the personal to the group, which in itself is kind of a process of, of, of a model of the way we make theater, you know, and taking that, so taking models of how we make theater and translating that to how we discuss and communicate with each other as we reflect upon our process of making theater and development. So, um, can I just clarify? Um, yeah. When you're talking about reaching out horizontally to, to your fellows, uh, to your colleagues, are these colleagues San Francisco based or is it local? Is it local? Is it national? Is it international? Who, 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 who are you reaching out to? Who are your colleagues? Yes, is the answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have created uh, in San Francisco, uh, part of that reaching out locally is we created a San Francisco Bay Area Ensemble Consortium, which is um, under the auspices of the NET, the Network of Ensemble Theater. So that we can do that. So we give each other tickets to our shows. We um, we meet monthly. We talk about um, a creative ways that we want to um, work together to share resources and support each other. Um, uh, let me clarify. It's actually not under the auspices of NET, but the members have to control the NET company, uh, NET members, right? But but point being, anybody you could do this here. Right? Exactly. I mean, you kind of are. You, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Laura said uh, when when the email went out about tech, do you have tech in the future? She said, well, I have you know I have photos of the process, and I was like, it's going to look exactly like what we're doing here is going to look like. So we have to show it up there. But, um, yeah. So so the 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 local it, that's an example of what we're doing. The national is really more what we've been doing for Fury Factory and right. and also Factory Parts because right. that was a national okay, that's, that's as well. We had people yeah, in the room from, right. from from all over the. Mm -hmm. So, who really can now connect, you know, just in the way that we're connecting with our mates in, you know, in Poland and France, and it, it, it's just a, it's, and I mean, you know, Ben lives in Santa Monica and I live in San Francisco and we're the directors of our, this company. We, we, you, we have to make this happen. So, um, valuing the online, the technical, how do we make that happen, and then also valuing the time we spend in the room together, so important. Um, yeah, so, so if you have more uh, interest in, in the specifics of the roundtable discussion and how that was led and different exercises and things, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm Devora Eliezer, and, um, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> I think the one thing that I would add to this is, again, that the mechanisms for any of these items are, they're not arbitrary, but they can be decided on in any way, but I think the thing that we found was was valuable and, and again not final, but was to instead of sort of saying, yeah, we're going to have feedback, and that becomes this blanket thing, and it, it's like the conversation can be with audience or with peers or what, 
um, we really tried to say, well, what are the levels that we want feedback at? And so create the appropriate opportunity for audiences, create the appropriate opportunity for peer to peer artists in the sense of, well, peers, but I just put on something and I want you to tell me about it. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third level around people had elements of that in it, but also was sort of the meta level. Like, what are we doing? What's the undertaking of this festival, of the field, etc.? cetera? Um, so we have the kind of conversation we've been having in this room the last couple of days. And I think that we, we often get stuck on, we're going to tell you what we thought about your show, which is helpful, but it's only one part of the thing. So, so just trying to create the structure to encourage this larger dialogue. Brian, I just. Sorry, it's Ollie down here. Uh, I just wanted to say, I'm sorry I didn't catch your names uh, with the sound quality of the, the, the two who were just speaking, but the, I just wanted to ask if you've come across the Bee Festival in Birmingham in the, in the United Kingdom. The, the Bee Festival? Uh, no, but can we come? <laughs> it's, the, festival run, the festival runs along the same lines as you were just outlining for the, the factory parts. It's, called the Birmingham European Theatre Festival, or B-Fest, B-E-Fest, and for the last four, five years? Four years. Four years they've been running, set up by a bunch of young theatre makers in Birmingham. It's a fantastic festival. Uh, they invite applications from all over Europe to present new work and work in development. Uh, people send their uh, footage of their show and a, a blurb that they choose four shows per night for five nights, and you have half an hour, uh, there's a work, in a work in progress, whatever you get, and the feedback system is very similar. You have, every audience member has a feedback card for the night, then the next day, all the artists are required to be present to have the feedback on the night, on the shows from the night before. You receive your peer feedback and the audience feedback in a written form later on, uh, and the festival um, sets itself up to be a way for new work and young companies to and present their work to a, to a public and to producers. But there would be a very interesting people for you to, to yeah. see what... It's a much smaller scale, but they're always looking to make links with other Very nice guys. We, we, we went as a theatre company two years ago and had a fantastic experience. Because we, as a theatre company, were finding it difficult to find people that would, would support us and show our work, and they were really great. Mm. So, yeah, so just, to, to, just to say, look them up, they're really good guys, it's a very interesting festival, very similar principles by the sound of it, from what you're saying. The, the festival is called Factory Parts, is that correct? I didn't hear that correctly. Uh, the, the performance series that we did last summer, with it, which was Just Works in Progress, was called Factory Parts. Our bigger festival, which is coming again in July, is called the Fury Factory Festival of Ensemble Theatre. Our, oh. com our company is Fool's Fury, so we're trying to keep it all in a very narrow framework. Yeah. Uh, applications and information, foolsfury.org. Is there a woman called Deborah involved in your work? Deborah? Yes. Um, I'm Deborah. Hello, we've actually exchanged mails in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled, yeah, thank you. I, I've been interested in your center for a long time. So I'm... So we're so coming, coming next together. month, right? We're yeah. ready for it. Yeah, so we'll be knocking on your door very Yeah, so, I mean, as much as Ben prefaced this as sort of his, his a shift of gears, I mean, for me, there's a lot of really similar threads throughout all of these conversations. I'm really, really aware that this session has been about kind of discrete presentation. So I would love to, to hear from other voices or things that stand out to you or, or, or things that you want to speak to um, if, there, if there's anything that, that, that really grabbed you from this, these kind of presentations or, or questions that you have about how your company can, um, or networks that you're running can, can link in or resources that you have. One of the things that stands out for me is the fact that we all have resources. And sometimes we, we overlook them. Yeah, like John's saying, what Kate and Ollie are providing is this resource, this amazing land, this amazing space that they're working so hard to take care of. Yeah, uh, and, and that's something that uh, can be overlooked. 
all the te actually technically that's only part of what. Oh no 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 absolutely so, absolutely. So, yeah, that's that's, not, that's not just commenting on that brand. It's yeah. really important that we have a complex set of resources. Absolutely. It's not just that each one of us has a thing. That when we really look at ourselves, we realise we have an enormous you know complexity of things that we can offer. And it's not so much saying, hey, this is what I've got. It's opening, it seems to me to be opening oneself up to say, why don't you ask me for anything? And if I don't think I can offer it to you, I'll say no. But Which is like what you were saying about Brisbane yesterday. Absolutely. Because, I mean, Kate and Ollie are doing something magnificent because they're kind of saying, we've got this range of stuff. How can we find various ways for people to engage with us as venue, as people who are, you know, they're in, you're in your 30s, but you have artistic experience, so younger companies are looking up to you as, you know, as a company with an aesthetic. So part of that is not saying, here's my product, I sell it, whether for money or for, or for, for just for will, but also saying, I don't know what I've got. Um, I, you know, you look at me, you tell me what you might want from me. And if I don't think I can give it to you, I'll say no. So I think there's a real complexity of resource that moves beyond the obvious. Oh, absolutely. That's definitely. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit. I've got this house. <laughs> that we, that we went. I mean, we stumbled onto this kind of amazing place in Burma, like in San Francisco. And when I moved in there, I was living with a few other artists and we would do stuff and sometimes we would write people who would look at it. Um, and recently, maybe two years ago, actually, once these other artists had moved out and I was left living with three people who weren't artists, um, I decided to try to revive that as a regular thing that would go on. So uh, every couple of months, we'd have a party. Um, and I loosely curate, which is to say, if someone wants to do something, I say yes. Four or five performances. Sometimes it's film. Sometimes someone will want to take the whole evening with a longer project. It's usually work in projects. We encourage people to do stuff they don't have any other venue for. Um, it, it's weird. It felt very undeliberate on my part, and it's actually become this really interesting thing. We can have. We usually have probably sixty to a hundred. There. I don't know them, except that I start to see them appearing time after time. But it's kind of what you're talking about. I mean, I know we had this space. I didn't really think about it as a performance space. I also like to cook. I like wine. Um, <laughs> I make sure all these things are <laughs> there. Yeah. It's actually for quite a number of people who come, they really talk to me a lot about how it's turned into this really important alternate economy. And I don't deal with money. I mean, I, I ask for 10 bucks from everyone. If they can, I mean, so if they can. Would you please be like the other people doing this? Yes. Yeah. But the other thing that's really interesting about it is that as as it grows, I'm finding myself becoming more of a hub, especially in terms of performance, because also people I know that come are like the curator of public programming at SMOMA or someone at the Performance Art Institute. So I'm finding that it's also placing me as someone who's now becoming a curator of performance. And without dealing with money yet, I'm, I'm now calling someone and saying, I've got this interesting artist who wants to program up there. So I think I'd, I'd love to get a copy of you sometime because on one hand, the next logical step for what this is would be what you're doing. On the other hand, what I really like about this is that the scale is tiny mm -hmm. and it's actually having tremendous impact on the lives of quite a small number of people and they don't want to risk that. So it's a it's a really interesting crossroads. There's also I think maybe something really important here that speaks to a question that you raised by in, in the kind of original materials that went out, which is how can a robust interfaces of the word of relationships perhaps be fostered between the bigger, more stable institutional structures and the small, mobile changing. And I think that what Michael's speaking to is that, is something which emerged kind of accidentally from a certain kind of radical generosity of, hey, this house works as an interesting space, and we'll see what happens at the others. And I do remember that the first time you said, <laughs> who are they? And it's really surprising the first time you filled up that much with strangers. And, and then that becoming, that fostering relationships with places like SF and, and or the, the, uh, or the, um, uh, the, uh, the Performance Art Institute, these 
exactly that kind of organic um, nurturance of these uh, institutional ties that can scan. Yeah, because people, I mean, there are people who start to look to me to provide content. You know, and I haven't turned it into a financial model yet, but, but you know, <laughs> I have a, um, just a, I, I've been thinking about this anyway since we're talking about resources, a couple of things that I just want to throw out there. One is that I teach at Marlboro, which is very close to here. It's a um, all world private school. <coughs> and um, I've been there for six years, and one of the very first things that I recognize when I walk onto that campus is that there is an enormous load of resources that is very much walled off in the way that only class people tend to wall off their things. However, there is within that, <laughs> there is within that um, you know, a group of artists and educators who are um, interested in actually sharing with the community. And the school is becoming, of course, more as they delve into 21st century learning and blah, 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 blah. Um, extending the four walls or pushing the four walls and um, engaging more globally and all that sort of thing. So, which is to say that for the last year, I think it's been, and maybe even a little bit before that, there are people in the room who we've had some contact with. Um, we've been opening up the spaces to, to host either workshops or um, rehearsals, development rehearsals, whatever. And um, so, so that's a resource that is, uh, it takes some work on the part of basically me and my colleague in terms of trying to figure out scheduling and that sort of thing, but it's, um, it's a resource that's available that I want to put out there and share. Um, and the, the side of that, the other side of that is that we would ask for some kind of bartering not in the sense of, I mean, no money would be exchanged, but you might have a, you might come in and teach a class, or you might, I don't know, I mean, I'll leave that open to what you might do. The other thing that has also come of that um, is a workshop that I presented that a number of people were at, and then out of that we decided, it was basically a bunch of teachers ended up being the ones who were in the room for the most part, and we realized we're all teachers, and teacher, teaching is a very isolating kind of activity, I think, um, when you're holding space for, especially for younger people, but even for when you're the person who has some kind of knowledge and sometimes the other people in the room don't have that knowledge and can be isolated. So we decided to keep an ongoing collective of teachers, and I feel like there's not really anybody in this room who's not a teacher on some level. Um, and so we're, you know, we're just at this point, we're just meeting once a month, but I'd also like to throw that out that it's and the idea is really, it's a rotating leadership. Whoever wants to take on the leadership for that month is welcome to do so. And it's there for you to engage in the questions you're interested in, to try out new exercises, to you know, to do as you wish. So, just for that. That's wonderful. Um, go ahead. Um, oh, no, I, I, one thing to say is actually harkening back to an earlier part of the conversation, but I think it's worth saying. I'm the least qualified person on the planet to talk about technology in any form. They don't understand it. But it keeps coming up how much things like all the things that make us cringe make us go. And I just felt the need to state the obvious that I've been able to take five years to develop a project in a really slow way with international collaborators because of technologies like this but also thanks to the brilliance of things like Indiegogo, mm -hmm. and in my case, which is sort of like a partnership, or the other one, a Kickstarter. Um, and in case you guys don't know, Indiegogo has a relationship with an organization called Fractured Atlas out of New York, which is my fiscal sponsor. I found them because Olya and Brian recommended them. And they make it really easy to set up your own thing and do it in your own way and get people to donate money tax deductibly. And it's been a huge gift because it has allowed a lot of time to develop new work without a lot of the pressures that come with infrastructure. And also because I feel like I'm too small to get a lot of infrastructure. I mean, I'm at that crossroads now, but it's taken a long time to even get on the map enough that that's an, an option. Can I ask 
you the question, but yeah. so, so is it functioning kind of like the, the tech version of the umbrella institution? In, in other words, that it becomes some sort of container through which you can get your phones, you can... Uh, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think literally the umbrella, yeah. not even the tech version. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what people donate money to, okay. fracture okay. out as a mm -hmm. minimum, small percentage of cut each yes. So for those of you who don't know Ivana, Ivana um, actually okay. spent uh, time for uh, a summer uh, month, right? M month uh, workshop? Two weeks. two weeks workshop with uh, at Kate and Ollie's place and uh, met Christopher Siebertson uh, there who has been her uh, colleague that she's been uh, dealing with online of virtually creating a piece for five years. He's as a, as a sort of director, dramaturg to her as a playwright, producer, actress. Um, and um, yeah, but I think two weeks together, two weeks to a month together, you're literally physically in the same town, and the rest of it is virtual. Fully mm -hmm. But I think I think on what Gleason was saying is, a, is an excellent kind of place to just pause as we set up for uh, for lunch for those who want to go to lunch and move on into the artists and academics uh, session for today. Um, and I want to just thank Kate Nolly and Duncan uh, so much for joining us. At, uh, and we will, uh, we will catch up soon, so, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and John and Anna, nice to see you <laughs> virtually. And Brian. And Brian. <laughs> Um, so again, uh, uh, as we as we um, as we switch gears, uh, Catherine will be moderating the next session, and I've got to make some Google Hangout calls. Uh, and the sandwiches are in you, the front. The sandwiches are in the front, and for those of you who want to head out, if you if you don't remember places to eat or you need to know places to eat, please ask. Thanks for having Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, hey.
participating knows exactly what the worth of the spaces were, what the value would be placed on it, like what the people that are owning and think it's worth, and, and so what this money is really going towards, and where, and then the rate of funding is coming from. This became a huge issue within the ensemble when, when all of a sudden our money accidentally disappeared, and we didn't know if we were going to get it back, and we didn't know if we were going to be able to do some project, or if we were going to do project, no one's going to get paid, you know? Um, so there was like two sessions where we were sort of like, well, this year we're doing, you know, I mean, I showed up for the so June session because I already, uh, I already, no, the May session, I just showed up not knowing if I was going to get paid, knowing that I would still be in the house, but um, not knowing if I was going to get paid for that or retroactively paid for the session before. So um, we found out the session. Before. So it's, yeah, it's a different like, this year's session. That's a different story. When I had already booked my tickets, I had already walked out. So like, I, there's no way for me to not go, right? I've, I've already taken the financial, you know? So I'm like, fine, I'm gonna show up, but you know, I thought that the human mission within the ensemble is with certain people that are like,
and we're actually I'm really good at finding like the best time and cheapest flights and you know the most of the time of the stuff. So I have a silly So we're going to have to um, toggle, Daniel, between, between, we're going to have to go back and forth between the PowerPoint and we'll hang out. Are you still on right now? Ben is here, I believe. Ben, are you still, are you still with us? Or are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. But Michelle's video. Can somebody else just say hi, Ben? Yeah. yeah. But Michelle's video is. No, uh, Maya. Michelle is reacting. Okay. But we have Maya for uh, PowerPoint.
Sustenance, yeah, and, and have a have a nice little uh, back and forth in small groups, which um, uh, which is always important. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna move into uh, a, 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 about an hour long conversation on the hyphen in between the artists and academics, which hopefully will continue some of the discussions we were just having on in the organizational resource sharing, which. Um, Catherine brought up about uh, how larger institutions can partner with smaller institutions. Um, that may come up. Uh, we have um, Maya Murphy uh, who's going to be uh, giving a presentation and we have Catherine who will be moderating. We are joined by Ben Spots from New York. Ben, are you still there online? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine, yeah? Yeah, there you are. There we are. And so we're joined by Ben Spots, who has an urban research theater, and has just uh, recently graduated with his PhD um, from CUNY, correct, Ben? Yeah, yes, from right. CUNY. And, uh, I'm ben, just I'm just cracking down here and, uh, to introduce myself really, really quickly. I'm Catherine. We met at Apple. I'm the woman who had the big uh, tray full of the fruit, and I gave you the plum. <laughs> <laughs> Down in the lobby. At Alpha? Doesn't ring a bell? Oh, yes, yeah. Yes. It was a great <laughs> one. <laughs> so, okay, are we ready to go? Okay, so um, I know that Maya, where did you just go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I know that Maya Murphy has a presentation. I think the way that I would like to do this is I want to make this as conversational as possible. And so I want to begin with Maya and Maya's presentation. And then I want to move to some ideas that I have on the wall up there and maybe ask some pretty rapid fire questions in the hope that that will lead to a larger conversation. I think it was really important that Lisa Bauer um, kind of raised this issue of probably nobody in here who doesn't do some kind of teaching. And so right away, when we're talking about this word academics, we're getting into these territories. And I think maybe that's part of what we want to break down to in the conversation. Um, and so, you know, and then there's a lot of people coming from all kinds of expertise about moving back and forth between worlds of teaching, worlds of research, worlds of practice, worlds of making. Um, you know, I think it probably touches most of us. So I really, you know, want to give people a chance to speak at some length, but I want to shift that back and forth between a lot of crosstalk. Um, and maybe also just change the energy of the day a little bit and bring the small group talk into the big group. Um, so I'm going to let both Ben and Maya, I, I'd like you to introduce yourselves because you'll do a better job at it and maybe talk a little bit about your backgrounds. And Maya, why don't you begin? And sure. then we can maybe go right to your presentation and then Ben will go to you. Great. Um, so I'm Maya, it's so nice to meet all of you this weekend, or see you again. Uh, I am uh, an artist scholar. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's for the presentation, but um, basically I have a background as a practitioner, but also for, uh, I was involved, many of you have heard from the weekend about Naropa University, a master's program based in physically created new ensemble work, and uh, I was the administrator for the inception of that program, and therefore part of my role was
was uh, helping the process of sort of equating studio and ensemble work to academic work, literally creating proposals saying this amount of studio work is equal to this amount of reading and paper writing, which mm. seemed like a very absurd thing to do, and yet we all knew we had to do it. So from then, on the one hand, um, you know, I had these, this sort of administrative life and also this creative life. I began to become really interested in this idea of, uh, you know, how do we express the value of our work? And so um, I just finished my PhD at UC San Diego, um, and I'll be teaching in the spring at USC. And um, so, you know, I'm very interested in how they work together and really how perhaps scholarship can support the work of ensemble work and this kind of creative work that we're all doing here because I feel like there's a lot of ways that we don't talk to each other and we can. So I'd like to begin with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I like to call this communicating the value of our embodied work, which perhaps is a philosophical project, and that's one um, tangent of it. Uh, so the value of embodied knowledge, I believe, is implicit, actually, in the discussion of the value of collaborative work. So whenever we're removing or destabilizing more traditional sources of authority in the theater, so a singular director or an authoritative text, we may shift or agitate or redistribute authority within the creative process. So the body then often takes center stage in the training for and the performance of collaborative work across, I believe, many styles and traditions. So through re-envisioning agency in the collective work on the ensemble, and locating that agency in bodies, collaborative artists are advocating for the body's ability to generate creativity and knowledge. And I think it's really hard, actually, to communicate this value beyond our creative communities. Uh, practitioners are masters at doing this in our own studios. We <coughs> use different techniques. We create language. We use metaphor. However, I think this value may be very difficult to communicate beyond the studio to audiences, to funding sources, to supporting institutions. So the issue, I believe, becomes very important and actually very practical when we're faced with what might be considered legitimate theater practices and structures and how notions of legitimacy actually affect the ability of collaborative artists to make work. And I believe that collaborative artists, we navigate this daily. And I propose that this problem at its base is actually due to a really deep anti-corporeal prejudice in Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to open up this discussion about ways that we might be able to, to combat this at the intersection of arts and academia. And I think that good examples of this are actually emerging. I'd include um, Chris Salata's book. I don't know if he's with us. Uh, unfortunately, Chris isn't here to, to speak on this today. We seem to have lost him, but uh, his most re his, the recent book that he came out with is The Unwritten Grotowski, mm -hmm. um, which just came out from Rutledge this year. He also has chapters in both of the books on collective creation, one on the Reduta Company, which we <coughs> spoke about briefly yesterday, which was one of the big models for Grotowski and a kind of intermediary piece uh, between Stanislavski and Grotowski and the other on the work center of Jersey Gutowski and Thomas Richards. That's yeah, great. thank you very much. You're welcome. So I believe that his work is very interesting in this way, how scholarship might be able to uncover the value, help us articulate the value of our practices. I think also the emerging field of performance philosophy is very interesting and perhaps making this kind of work. But first, I'd like to further expose this problem, which is why is it so hard to talk about the body in Western philosophy? Would you the slide, please? Um, and you might say, <laughs> you might say, Maya, we talk about the body in Western philosophy all the time, but then I would probably fumble around my words and say something very inarticulate and then just say, you know, really talk about the body. And so even Judith Butler, who has so much to say about the body in scholarship and has written so much, she admitted that the quote, vocational difficulty for those trained in philosophy, always at some distance from corporeal matters, is that they can invariably miss the body, or worse, right against it." Unquote. So I suggest to you that it's hard to talk about the body because its dominant knowledge paradigm is so deeply rooted in language that it cannot comprehend embodiment and its value. And so I suggest that theater, as an embodied practice, actually has something to offer a new embodied epistemological knowledge and new body knowledge paradigm. Slide, please. And so I don't mean that philosophy should just kind of keep borrowing our practices and structures or metaphors. 
like people are like actors and life is like a stage. And I also don't mean just grafting philosophy on top of practices to show how practices are exemplifying these existing philosophical trends. I mean investigating our practices and excavating our philosophical principles that are founded on and born from embodiment. And I have an example from my own tradition, but first, um, you know, I, I wasn't familiar with John Britton's um, uh, workshop material, like the title of your material, Self with Others, right? Mm -hmm. And even just hearing that title to me, not only is it ethical, and you've spoken to this, but to me it even, it even points toward a, a real philosophical structure that's already embedded in the work that he's doing. So, I, you know, I'm interested in how do we excavate that to understand that as an actual philosophical structure rather than saying what kind of philosophy might apply to your work. So for my uh, slide, please, uh, I come from a Lecoq tradition. And so, for instance, uh, if, many of, if you've done this kind of work, Lecoq founded many of his actor training methods on the practice of identification. And so identification is when the actor takes something outside of herself. It may be a thing, a chair, an animal, or something imagined, like a blazing fire. And then she moves through a three-step process, and the steps are seeing, embodying, and applying. Slide, please. So if the actor practices identification with a blazing forest fire in the studio, obviously it's not there, right? First, she would see it. She, hopefully it's not there. <laughs> First, she would see it. She would imagine what it looks like and how she may or may not be able to come into contact with it. What are with the, the senses that are evoked from this kind of encounter? Uh, how can she approach? How is she limited? The second step, she would embody it. So she would take on the rhythms and the space and the dynamic of this forest fire that she sees in the studio in her imagination. And third, she would apply it. So in the case of theater, she might apply it to characterization, a fiery character. She might apply it to an overall scene. Right? How might a scene have the same kind of rhythm of a fire that she explored? So if Descartes' dictum of I think, therefore I am, enables a linguistically based knowledge or philosophical foundation, Lecoq's epistemological or knowledge-based dictum is, I embody, therefore I know. Slide, please. So then what kind of philosophy might that enable? What are its limits, its potentials on one level? I think this is akin to phenomenology. But how might it offer a different kind of richness by valuing not just first-person lived experience, but the possibilities of an embodied and imaginative encounter with the other as lived experience in one's own body. So this proposition, it brings the value of the body in creativity and in philosophy to the forefront. And it reconstructs this body as a generator and a conduit for value and meaning making. So my provocation then is how, why, how might we continue to find ways to reframe and communicate the value of our own embodied work outside of our world? Mm, love it. Thank you. Um, I want to. Can we bring? Can we bring? Can we bring a sort of semi-embodied bed back? In? <laughs> um, I want to just return to something later in the conversation, but I don't want to forget about it, so I put it on the wall, which is this. You know, I think maybe implicit provocation that lies deep in in what I hear Maya raising, which is the very notion of having to talk about the body rather than do things through the body or the body being taught, which is part of maybe the, the depth of the tension here. A thing which needs to be set out in front of you and analyzed being so perhaps essential to the academic project and that may be one of the roots of the problem. So let's just kind of leave that up there. Um, ben, what I would really, do, Ben, do you, you tell me, do you have a specific presentation that you want to make, or do you want to be engaging in the flow of the conversation? Because there's a couple of ways I could go right now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. No. First of all, okay, good. Uh, I'm wearing these big headphones, I can hear you better with them. First of all, um, would you introduce yourself a, to I, everyone? Again? Would you introduce yourself to everyone? Yes, uh, I'm Ben Spett. Um, I have just finished a PhD at CUNY. Uh, City University of New York, and 
I've been teaching also there for several years. The dissertation, which I'm now working on turning into a book, is about embodied knowledge, so that's what I would like to say something about. Um, and uh, I also have been leading this, uh, this uh, project, let's say, called Urban Research Theater for the last nine years, starting in Poland. I lived in Poland for two years, uh, and then back in New York City, and it's been a variety of uh, solo projects, duo projects, and ensemble projects. Um, I guess the one thing that I would say about that already is that um, my scholarly project and my practical or artistic work have been largely separate. There was not any frame in my doctoral program to actually explicitly introduce my own work. And I ended up being grateful for that. The two projects are parallel, and I see a, I see a possibility for them to come together uh, in the future, but they, they, are, they are deeply related, but, but actually also separate. So that's something about the hyphen in my life. <laughs> but I do, I, I have a few notes. I don't have a, a, like a formal presentation, but I have a few notes that maybe I could begin. Okay, then why don't you begin with a few notes, and then I think that what I'll try to do is kind of draw this back into this larger conversational frame, so go ahead. Great. Um, so yes, academia, uh, the, the role of, of art and artists in academia, certainly resource, resource sharing, which has been discussed, and I, I was eavesdropping through the howl round on the previous session and, and listening to the discussion of resource sharing, which is very important. Um, what I want to think about now and, and say a few things about is less about the practicalities of resource sharing. It's very important. Uh, of course, the power uh, and the funding and all these things and the prestige that are associated with academia uh, and how to distribute that and make that accessible and use that. Um, but what, I'm, what I want to think about now and kind of where my, my more concrete thinking is, is about the epistemology of academia, the, the ways that academia deals with knowledge, the systems and the techniques and the methods that uh, the academy has developed for thinking about knowledge, uh, for, for um, producing knowledge, for teaching knowledge, uh, for defining research, uh, for developing research methodologies. These are all the things that I am really excited to apply to embodied practice. Um, I, I resonate with a lot of things that Maya said. Hello, Maya. Uh, for example, the, um, <clears throat> the need to communicate the value of embodied practice, uh, the value of embodied knowledge, um, and the point about the, the, the fundamental distance that philosophy has from the body, even when it talks about the body. And I, and I very much resonate with this, what was just said by the moderator, uh, about um, having to, this obligation to talk through, to talk about the body, as opposed to doing things through the body. And that's where I want to ask my question today, um, because I, I think that sometimes we think of um, the academic knowledge structures, the epistemologies of academia, as being very tightly bound up with language. And to some extent, that's true. I mean, it's the circulation of essays and books is a fundamental part of academia. Um, but academia is not just the circulation of text. Academia also involves, as you were mentioning, uh, pedagogy, which is, at least for now, mostly embodied. Uh, and uh, that is, people are in the room together. Uh, and academia now, with, uh, with all the video possibilities, the multimedia possibilities, uh, it becomes possible that multimedia documents can also circulate almost as easily as text documents. So those are two ways in which I think we shouldn't underestimate uh, academic epistemologies by thinking that they are the same, but by equating them uh, with, with language and with discourse. So my questions uh, are about methodology and about pedagogy. But uh, maybe I've, I've said enough of, about that, and we can return to those things. I want to just offer a few little provocations, um, three little provocations. First provocation, uh, if we're going to talk about knowledge, then I, I just wonder about the place uh, of historical context for that knowledge. And, and uh, I think that sometimes um, I'm thinking about what Maya was saying about principles. I'm also thinking about Robin Nelson's recent book about practices research, where he basically says practices research uh, is more about synchronic uh, comparisons, more about what's happening now than about any historical context. So I want to push on that and say, uh, well, what is the historical context for the knowledge that, that embodied practices produce or contain? 
uh, in terms of the, the value, that, so okay, that's provocation number one. Provocation number two is um, we're talking about art and academia, the artist scholar, um, and the word research is implicit there, but uh, I wonder, at least for myself, if sometimes the notion of art and all the associations that we have with art and art making and artistry are actually uh, a little bit counterproductive or, or some of the ways that they can be counterproductive uh, when we're trying to think about embodied knowledge, about framing the value of our work in terms of knowledge. I often think that we should be framing our work in terms of knowledge rather than making art. And I think that that might be a, a provocative thing to say because uh, aren't we looking for the knowledge in art? But not necessarily. I, I just think that the reason I said embodied practice before is because I think sometimes uh, we actually are reducing what embodied practice is when we think of it only in terms of art. And actually maybe knowledge and research are our intention with that idea of art, particularly in terms of assumptions about who the audience is for the work that's being done. So two new provocations, not three. I combined two of them. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I want to take both what Ben's saying and what Maya's saying and some things I've been hearing and some things I know colleagues of mine are talking about um, and something that Scott Proudfit, for those of you who were here yesterday, spoke to really briefly because I think there's a web of intersections and maybe I'm creating a kind of a broad map for starting a conversation, but I think there are some things that are getting excluded um, that are actually <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, that it, Gleason talking about the institution where she teaches brought up for me. Um, so we're talking about embodiment. We're talking about knowledge. We're throwing around the word epistemologies. We're talking about writing about thinking through embodiment. And what I think keeps getting excluded here are classroom practices. And I so that I think that as we're talking about artists in academia, we are squeezing out of that framing all of the many ways and many audiences for whom and with whom we teach and explore what we do. And I think that this matters, a historical place to take this from is, again, what Scott Proudfoot was saying yesterday, when he raised the issue of play as fundamental to collective creation, and he alluded briefly back to something which is becoming central in the next, thing, the next book that we're working toward, which was the role of women in classrooms, working with children, exploring play, being at the roots of a lot of early collective creation. And he mentioned the settlement house movement in the United States um, and the work of Neva Boyd and Viola Spolin coming out of that and everything that goes from there. What he didn't mention was that something very similar happened in France. Uh, it happened with a woman named Suzanne Bing, who was the lover of Jacques Coupeau and actually seems to have been responsible for the pedagogies that gave rise to French mind. And she got a lot of her ideas from working with some Montessori teachers, so we're coming back to women, uh, progressive education, uh, childhood education, and play. Um, and also working sometimes with impoverished or disenfranchised communities. And then that becoming a source of ideas about creativity that can be taken into work with adults. So I think we have a very complex network of who gets written in, who gets discussed, what is research, what is an epistemology, um, what language we use to talk about all of these things, what the politics are, where women uh, fit into this, what it means to be the person on the ground who does but doesn't write up theory, and how you get written out of those histories. So this, this, there's a lot in the room, I think, that's, that comes back through the questions that Maya started with and Ben built on about embodiment versus the written traces that we study and that become the tools of analysis that maybe are not our only tools of analysis but are, are part of what sort of frames value in the academic world. So that's one side of it. I also put a bunch of questions up there because it comes back to the institutional stuff. What are the possibilities of these intersections between these different institutions of teaching and the practices we do? And how do you experience that? What are the obstacles in your lives? What are the things you need to resist, either 
in taking your research into a practical realm, non-practical research into a practical realm, or the other way with your institutions? How do you see the culture of those institutions or those relationships changing or not changing? Or what do you think we can do about it? So that's a lot of questions. And I think I'd like to go around really fast and just begin to hear from you. Who is working inside of some kind of institution of teaching and creating artwork either outside or in that institution and finding it really rich? Who's liking that experience? Anybody? Yes. Can you can you begin to say something to it? Um, I, you know, I, the reason I find it rich is because of all of these questions, and because of the way in which they swirl around each other, um, because of the challenge. Of, and I work in a women's institution, basically, mm -hmm. I work in an all-girls school, um, which is <laughs> primarily led by women. Um, so the challenge of languaging the work and finding a way to get it valued is both frustrating, but it's also exciting. It feels to me like something that on some really core level I've been dealing with since I was first asked to try and write my self into existence on a college level. Um, and, and my own feelings around, like, isn't this kind of really patriarchal? But then also, how do we pass on this information? And, you know, like, the, all those things swirl in me, so I find it rich in that way. I don't always find it easy or um, satisfying. It's almost always the, it's the problem. I mean, I just got done talking with my colleague about this constant <laughs> push to um, to go to add more as opposed to go deeper, to quantify mm -hmm. as opposed to value qualitatively. Like those things constantly. So those are the obstacles working against. Yeah. So that's that's my question. Thank you. Who else wants to speak to something that has been positive? I'm yes, in a different direction. kind of institution. I often work inside of a Zen center mm -hmm. where I teach meditation and I also run bizarre theater experiments. And um, <laughs> what one thing that that really affords is the ability to go really deep and work with people who don't normally do theater. And they open themselves in all these ways and all these things, but. Um, that also means that the, the process of translating that outside and the, the question of value, the value of language, how that goes outside of that into the world of theater. This year was the first time that I worked with, a, I brought a large group of actors from Europe and from the East Coast to Northern California to work with some of the practices that I've been developing in that environment. Um, and made a performance that was like actually funny and people really liked, you know, and it like existed in the world in like a concrete way. But before that, we'd always been working, I've been working in a very, totally insular and not even really knowing what I was doing with bullshit or not, you know, to be frank. Um, and, and so it was just, but then the question of, of, of how language is valued and how, how you communicate an experience that's very meaningful for a small group of people that has, you know, overtones and has commonalities with like depth psychology and meditation practices and all those things. And then you're dealing with like, well, what's your play about? So that's, that's another way to talk about these acts of translation. Yeah, and, and especially from the group out into the world. Yeah, and working more from a group where meaning is very much contained in a shared experience, and then the process of translating that out into a more commercialized world, which I also do work in. Thank you. Who else has, you know, and, and Ben, feel free to step in at any point if, if any of these questions are speaking to you directly. Who else? Yes, Sharon. Well, um, Sorry. On the positive side, the beautiful things about, and I happen to have the great privilege of being a tenured professor, which <laughs> took a long time. But um, what the, the positive thing about the, about working in, with scholarship in academia is academic freedom and the academic freedom to follow. And my degree, I mean, I was an actor when I was twelve. I, I thought I was giving it up when I went to college and started studying Russian. <laughs> Obviously, I did not. Um, you know, but but the, the freedom to say, okay, I'm going to get a PhD in Russian and not lose my roots as an actor and find a way to blend these things has been extraordinarily liberating because, as you know, because you know my work, mm -hmm. it goes 
everywhere in terms of um, the scholarship. Um, I'm not in a field that limits me. So I've written about Stanislavski. I've written about the Russian avant-garde. I've written, I've written about, about practices. Tall, uh, town festivals in Puerto Rico as performance events that have analogs in, in medieval theater. I've written about the ballet Russe. I've, I've, I've worked with, uh, with my dance background with choreography. So I'm looking at acting and performance in this multi-dimensional way. That's the beauty of it. Nobody tells me what to study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, the challenge and this is, it's speaking to mind. The true and frustrating challenge of working in academia is a, a sense, even in this interdisciplinary world where interdisciplinary work is, is lauded, is not the anti-corporeal aspect of it, but the anti-intellectual mm -hmm. approach to, act, to, to, to artists. And a sense that even in the best of our universities, there is a division between a PhD and an artist. And even among the artist col uh, colleagues of mine, there can be a true kind of prejudice against somebody who has a PhD. And so my question always, as an academic who is also an artist, is how do you how do you persuade people not, not only to talk about the body, but for people who understand the body to be able to accept the intellectual and understand that one body is really both of these things and can be both of these things with equal power at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's mm -hmm. what I would say about Thank you. Um, and and we'll, we'll come back to some of the obstacles because I think that maybe part of what I'm hoping for from this conversation is to break down some of these right. divisions. These are fundamentally false divisions. We're carrying them into this conversation. Right. And so I think there is, I think maybe I'm seeing this as an act of dismantling. Deborah, you had your hand up. Oh, I just, uh, on a positive level, Sorry, uh, Fool's Fury is in residency at the French American International High School, which is kind of like a dream. They have their own arts pavilion that they built in San Francisco. Um, they have four drama teachers for high school. They um, and so we're in residency, and they have a black box theater. It's a beautiful one. You know, we get to be there usually when the students are not and use it for our rehearsal space. Um, however, we also. Uh, participate in the training of the students. And um, and last year, spilling into 2014 spring, there's a two year long project um, uh, that is, involves the students, um, a French artist named Moise Touré, and also Francis Viette, who used to dance with Pina Bausch, mm. who's a partner with him. They're coming from France every few months. Um, professional artists are coming in, including ourselves, to participate and be with the students. And then there are like three different iterations of how the, they're gonna work on Greek tragedy, education, democracy, and, and how it relates to our society today. And so we are positively like involved in the students' work. They're doing works, in, they're doing um, site-specific work, they're doing um, a choral piece, and then they're doing actual extant play. The Greek, Greek, they're doing Ajax and Antique. Anyway, there's many ways that we're involved, and we are also making this our year-long project professionally in our work, creating our own professional piece. So the best, the, we get the best of everything. We come in, we get to work with the students, we get to meet the, the, the teachers are all part of it as well. They all train with us. Mm. And then, and the public, and then, and then we get to go make our own work. And of mm -hmm. course, I have my eye on a few of the students because I want to make it intergenerational, mm -hmm. bring them into what we do. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of intercollaboration, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's a quite fertile time. Yeah, that's great. yeah. There's a lot of blocks I can talk about, but yeah. that's <laughs> really good. <laughs> yeah. Ben, you you had it. You sort of went mm, a little while ago, so you wanted to jump in there. <laughs> 
Yes, that was in response to the previous uh, point about the, the anti-intellectual and the anti-practical, this kind of tension, which is um, not Sharon's. only in theater, but, sorry? Uh, just, I was saying Sharon, Sharon Murray Carnegie, in case you were wondering about oh, the name. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, oh. Yes. Honored to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, uh, which is not only theater, uh, but it's also in other kinds of in, uh, practice. I mean, even like uh, sports or something else, where right, there's yeah. a kind of tension uh, between between the, the between practice and theory. I just wanted to mention, and specifically related to theater, um, this question, this this issue of the audience uh, and assumptions about. Who the audience is, um, I think that probably we could easily come up with uh, critiques of academia in the sense, especially the research aspect, in the sense of being uh, potentially elite, being very isolated, the whole ivory tower idea. Um, but I think that in the tension between theater, especially the MFA PhD tension in theater uh, and performance, um, part of what's happening there is that there's also uh, there's a there's a need to critique the, um, the the assumption that what happens in the practical work, the embodied work, achieves its reality uh, in the in the general public sphere in the moment when it's uh, when it's performed for an audience of people who are not experts. Uh, and I think that I think actually Grotowski's work, which uh, Chris Chris's book was mentioned, um, is. Why one of the things that it, that it was said so provocative about and so striking about the work center uh, and the history of the work center is this idea that there might be a practical work, particularly a practical research, that might go on for a long time and be very valuable, uh, partly through pedagogy rather than uh, through public performance. Uh, and and that that um, I think that also speaks to the value of pedagogy. I think that, that for example, when I teach acting. Uh, at CUNY, um, I, I try always to uh, reframe the acting class uh, in the way that like uh, an introductory English class is reframed, that it's it's not so that you can become a professional writer uh, necessarily, it's because there's a body of knowledge here that will serve you in a lot of different mm -hmm. ways. Yes. Uh, but I yes. think that still often in, in the acting and the relationship to the BFA, MFA track is, is very, there's just a huge gravitational pull towards uh, the idea of the public sphere and the validation of the work in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that I want to say there should be an elitist concept of research instead, but I do think that's part of that tension is about who is the work valuable for? Yes. Does it achieve its value? Uh, does it need to be valuable to everyone? Or, or how do we situate practices that are achieving their value uh, through pedagogy and also through peer, through sharing with, with, with a community of people who are really caring about those little details that would actually bore a general public? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Michael. I mean, that, that, Sorry, that, I, that's sort of what I was, Catherine and I went to grad school together, and I, I think for both of us, or at least for me, I'm also both, yeah, one of the most rewarding experiences I've had in relation to the institution was when we actually managed to import laboratory time into institutional time yeah. and convince, even on a departmental level, convince people that a long process without quantifiable results in the short term was worthwhile and that this work was like laboratory projects going on mm -hmm. at Stanford. And that was very good for us and very good for students. And to me, that, and, and Can I, I add a layer yeah, to yeah, that? Yeah. I also think that what was really <coughs> rich for me personally, and I don't know to what extent it feels this way to you or it felt this way to Chris or Daniel and you know, our whole cohort, but we had to resist things. We were in a program that made claims about merging the artistry and the scholarship. Mm -hmm. To varying degrees, and for me this was particularly intense, we didn't experience it as being anything like that at all. Um, and so we had to, as a cohort, push back. And in pushing back, we articulated a whole hell of a lot about what mattered to us. Yeah. Um, and what we wanted to then bring into our own teaching, and bring into institutions, so the very fact that we had to form a group to fight and to articulate and to figure it out became very productive. The resistance became productive. Um, so sometimes it's in that collision. And, the, and the, just to follow up with what Ben was saying, and, and the work at that point had no relation to the public sphere at all, I mean, or the market. Yeah. And it really was the dream of the kind of work that you could do in an academic environment. 
that's not answerable to questions of the and that's even part, of, that's part of the epistemology of academia. It's not just the resources of academia. It's like academia actually has a, a, an epistemology that supports uh, when work might need to be uh, not immediately judged in the public sphere for a while, what, how the, the a community of knowledge operates. I'd like yeah. if this is okay. No, uh, you had your hand up. I want to get to you, and then I'm going to make a switch. Tell me your name again. Tanya. Tanya, go ahead. Oh, um, so I teach at Cal State LA in East Berlin. And one day I got an email from a random administrator saying, Dear Professor King Perry, please send us an Excel spreadsheet showing the learning outcomes of your students. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote back and I said, Dear random administrator who I don't know, I am afraid I cannot provide you with the document you've requested. However, I'd be happy to send one of my students to your office to perform a monologue. <laughs> <laughs> did you really? Yes, I did. And they you. never bothered me. And to that, right, learning outcomes, of course, is one of those aspects that the uh, accreditation board uses to want uh, to a to accredit universities, including community colleges and universities in, in the state of California, and all of us now are obligated on every syllabus to, to include, include your learning outcomes. So it's I know that, that John really wants to, yes. to speak to this. Because just because having just resigned from an academic college <laughs> <laughs> uh, after eight years and, and wanting to make it absolutely plain that I do not have a problem with the academic endeavor uh, or the slightest concern about the integrity of people who are working within the system. And I do want to make that plain because the last thing I am is intending to be oppositional. Uh, it felt to me that there was a battle that, in my work, I, I was no longer interested in addressing. Um, it's an important battle, but it was one that I was no longer interested in trying to fight. And it was this battle which comes to what you're talking about that there is a deep, profound learning that happens uh, at the embodied level. We know that. We, we see the transformations of ourselves and of other people in the studio space. And I think Ben is talking to this a little bit as well. There is a deep level at which that embodied learning is transmitted uh, generation to generation by people going into studios who have themselves been in studios. One of the things that's most important to, to, to kind of realize that all of these great names that we talk about, they were all people who went into studios and did stuff without mm -hmm. knowing what the hell they were doing. Mm -hmm. They were doing exactly what we're doing. Learning You're trying to find mm -hmm. stuff, and they're transmitting what they have learned inarticulately often and I use that word advisedly, without able to articulate, we transmit our knowledge body to body, generation to generation. Now, there, there We're is- very articulate, but through the body. But absolutely, okay, so yeah. Like, it, I, you, yeah. <laughs> what I mean by inarticulate is not being able to articulate verbal, yeah. verbal linguistically, Cass rationally. Yeah. In it. So it's an embodied knowledge. We don't know what it is. And yes. embodied expression until you, know, yeah. until you experience it. So, so ab ab this is absolutely what I'm saying. That there is an absolute uh, kind of truth and passion and, and intelligence there. Mm -hmm. My experience of the university system, and it's mine and nobody else's, <laughs> my experience of the university system was that it does not sit alongside learning outcomes, assessment criteria, whereby a student must learn a certain amount within a certain time frame. Maybe she's not ready to learn it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she's going to have three years of struggle and then two days after graduation go, hallelujah, I'm embodied. In which case she has simply not understood the term embodied. But that's another thing. Uh, it, they don't sit alongside each other. And this, for me, and I wasn't in the end, it's like trying to make things do this. It's kind of change gear without putting the clutch down in the car. I ended up with the sense of despair as an academic practitioner about the inability to reconcile embodied knowledge into an academic structure which is verbal linguistically based. I think it's a battle that's entirely worth having, but it did seem as if we are simply talking about parallel streams that frequently, from both directions, as Sharon says, I simply fail to understand right. each other. 
And I think that's a, a, the, the, the most essential tension if you want to work in the university. I'd like to throw something in here, if I may, and then I'll come back to you, because there's, there's a slippage here that I think is important, that the other tension is in this idea of articulation. Mm -hmm. And the provocation that I'd like to throw mm -hmm. out is that I know some brilliant actors who, when they hear an idea, will create an image, and I'm thinking of Alexa, will create an image in a second that is a synthesis of many ideas that holds in it a poetic multiplicity of interpretations, and it goes in space. And that to understand the thoughts and ideas that are conveyed by actors who are articulate in their bodies in that way is a kind of literacy. Mm -hmm. And that when we buy into the language, and it's just not blame, but I think we buy into it, that articulate means your words. Mm -hmm. And that to learn to understand how to express ideas is to learn to read and to learn to write. Then we are, it's not just about embodied knowledge. It's about the speaking that we're not learning to understand. And so I'm wondering if part of the work of being a performer in an academic setting is also about teaching people how to see differently, other things that they should be reading, et cetera. And that, you know, we keep, we keep sort of weighing this in a defensive way, and maybe there's a kind of offensive action, I don't mean offend, but, but a, you know, a forward action of, you know, there's this other speak that goes on in the world. It's, it's or, bringing orality back up to literacy as opposed to we, we talk about pre-literate cultures, mm -hmm. as opposed to talking about oral cultures that did not use language and worked in a completely different thought um, um, paradigm. paradigm, yeah. They're mm -hmm. thinking, they're, what they say is being created, it, it is being, a story is being told, a storm is happening, the, the crack thunder that happens is incorporated into the story. That it's an active way of delivering information rather than a, a, a way that's in comparison with everything that's been written and been said and recorded. And um, so taking orality and which I feel like is what we're doing, uh, body in our bodies as well. We're trying to bring it from being down here below literacy to being back up here. Like this is. This is valuable. Communicating mm -hmm. our story. Yes, communicating Fair stories, right. speaking our stories to each other, not not relying purely on the written. I mean, it's our, it's happened. It's been happening for years in this field. It's just that I think we can talk about it differently. I think we are starting to talk about it differently. Um, I think then that, that this is maybe shifting us to the, some of the, the bottom categories that I threw up there, which is this idea of. You know, are there things we're trying to resist? Or is there a culture we're trying to change? And I think maybe obstacles are kind of a subcategory of that, right? You know, because the obstacles are the thing we're trying to change. Can we build up? Can you tell me your name? Lizzie. Lizzie. Could I add something to that? Yes, Ben, please. Uh, I just, I, yeah, I, I very much agree with the, the last couple of things that were said. Um, and I want to just add um, that we shouldn't overestimate the uh, level of articulateness or uh, explicit knowing that is in other fields. Um, we, we've been talking about embodied knowledge, and I think we're, we're mostly using it to mean, for example, knowledge of acting and dance and the way that that's in the body. But the other field of, that talks about embodied knowledge is the work on cognition and embodied knowledge in general in philosophy and in science, which is not saying that dancers and actors have knowledge that is specifically embodied, but it's actually saying that all knowledge is embodied. Yes. And the work on the sociology of science or the philosophy of science is pointing out that the fields that we think of as extremely hard, uh, as extremely explicit and located in language, are also full of tacit knowledge. They're also full of oral culture and oral communication and, and knowledge. And, and, and they're also full of people going into rooms and not knowing what's going to happen or what they're going to do. Um, so I think we, we shouldn't exaggerate uh, how exceptional uh, theater is. I guess that's my question for, for John, uh, that, that I think that, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I think there are differences, absolutely, uh, in terms of what can be articulated and how and in what media, but I think we shouldn't exaggerate the exceptionality of, uh, of theater and dance, say, as uh, impossible to be put into words without recalling that 
actually uh, much of science and history and mathematics and everything is, is also happening through tacit knowledge that's not articulated, that's not possible to put into words, that wasn't known from the beginning, but was discovered through fooling around. Are you looking at me because you want to address that and you're waiting for approval? Uh, I like approval. Um, I, 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 I would agree with you entirely, Ben. I agree with you entirely. I think it was not so much uh, my the frustration that, that I increasingly encountered was not so much with the uh, process of attempting to translate one form of knowledge to another. That, that was always endlessly interesting in its way. It was in fact trying to uh, translate a form of pedagogy, which is experiential learning, into a language of assessments and, and learning outcomes which are not, I think, uh, orientated towards experiential learning. So and not articulable in those yeah, terms. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I entirely agree with you, Ben, and I, I thank you for clearing up the, the confusion, because I, you know, embodied knowledge is the heart of everything we do. We, we, you know, it's embodied, what we do. But I, I think also pedagogy as a practice, I, I want to share something institutional right now that I hope will make you laugh. <laughs> uh, I, I teach I teach a Greek and Roman class in the fall. I've taught it for several years, and I've uh, generated a methodology that goes back and forth between sitting and working with a text in a normal way, getting up and doing embodied workshops to understand how the um, how texts encode physical performance, mm -hmm. like the texts of music encode the sound of, of, of the music that we call music. It's not, it's not the notes, it's not the text that makes it. And I, I originated a way to do this that involves a constant getting up and sitting down and mm -hmm. getting up and sitting down. Well, this year I walked into my classroom and the university had bought us new chairs. No. And the chairs, without asking anybody, uh, they and you they're here. the kind, they're monstrous yep. chairs that were built by the company that uh, spun off from Apple as this kind of new technological chair with these wheels and a place for your backpack. And all you've taught in one of them for your, you know, and there's 40 of them in our classroom. And suddenly, I was absolutely enforced in an institution that is actually telling us to get away from the lecture, to be unable to do anything in that room except lecture, because there was no way to pile the chairs against the wall. And so I had to fight with my own school to get a studio space that we could actually go back and forth to. So now we're like the floating crab game. Some days we meet with these chairs, and some days we go to the studio. And it's, but what I love about, about thinking about this in those terms is that even the institution can sometimes shoot itself in the foot. Because in this case, our institution wants us to do this kind of work. And, and, and yet, the, the, the sense of disconnect between somebody who buys a chair. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I, I feel like it just kind of makes pragmatic some of the difficulties when even somebody is trying to help you. I, I want to, because I know we're going to have to wrap. I saw some hands up. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I saw some hands up, and I just want to give a couple of other people an yeah, opportunity no, to speak. Sorry. So you, do you have your hand up? No, I'm sorry, I might have been moving my hair. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have that? Yeah, please. So this is, um, I'm just gonna throw this out there in a, in a completely unformed way, which I think is to my point, which is I just wanna also reframe this back into a larger context of the feminine and the masculine on the Thank level you. of, um, not not male, female, whatever. I think everybody in the room certainly. Ideas right. of the masculine, yes, ideas right. of the feminine, and how does that, it form that? Yeah, and that I just, I mean, it strikes me over and over again, even in this conference, which is a bunch of, of embodied people whose technology is their bodies, that we've spent an enormous, and it's not meant to be critical, mm -hmm. but that we, that even here we favor the sitting mm -hmm. and the, the talking. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was just saying this yesterday, and it's just, I'm like, because I'm so filled with ideas, I 
and the more sensitive I become, the more trained I become, the less capable I am of actually sitting through. There's a point where it's like, <laughs> and that's what that's what's hap that's what happens. And I think that that's actually real. And I think that the numbing, there's a numbing that happens um, in our in our culture that that allows for the more so we can be more this. And um, and I and then okay, so this is all completely informed. And then I'm thinking about learning, and I'm thinking that there's also a transition where there is a really feminine way of learning. And when I mean that, I mean in a there's a reception kind of being in the not knowing, being in the state of wonder that happens when we're young, and oftentimes surrounded by the feminine way of learning. And then that transfers over when we get into school, where it becomes codified and. Um, penetrating um, that that happens and it becomes a little more masculine and then there's this thing of uh, it gets tight. Now the thing I want to say around all of that that I think is hopeful and gets me excited and why I say that it's rich this tension is then there's sex which can be fucking awesome. <laughs> um, so somewhere there's like there's a place where those two things could actually meet on equal ground. And yes. I don't yeah. see that happening any, I mean, I don't see that happening in too many places. I see it happening in studio sometimes. I don't see it happening in the academy, but but, but that's possible, so that's exciting. I, I, because I know that we have to move to the next thing. I, I, I'm going to wrap, but I think I want to end by re-articulating that. I didn't know where the conversation was going to go. It went to some totally other place. <laughs> and the big impulse I hear in it is this thing about pushback. It's what do we know? What are our speakings? What is the moving? What do we want to take back? Um, uh, what other kinds of conversations do we have? How can we speak across these ridiculous divisions between the different kinds of institutions in which we practice our work? Um, that seems to be what's coming out of this, and I just think it's a really generative place to leave off. <laughs> Thank you. Ben, did you want a last word? <laughs> Since you're up on the big screen. <laughs> I would, I, I would second what someone else said about maybe sending the emails, or at least I would love yes. to know who, I can't even tell exactly who is in the room. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you, Ben. We'll, 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 we're going to share uh, around later all of that information. So, so thanks a lot for joining us, Ben. Yeah. Maya, thank, thank you, you for kicking that off and indeed, so thank much. You, Maya. Um, so we just need to do a couple little technical things and then we're going to, um, uh, you know, hopefully take this conversation further into the next session. But please take a, take a few moments to uh, get up and jump around or whatever you need to do. <laughs>
participants, we need to we need to kind of move the next conversation on. Um, hard to be. So we're going to begin the next session with Lizzie Watt. And if you can all help me by pushing the chairs a little bit off the off the stage. Um, you, don't need, you don't need to get rid of them. We just need to uh, push them to the sides or a little bit off the stage in the front. So that we can do a little bit of moving and build upon the uh, sort of provocation that Gleason just left us with. And um, <laughs> I, we can we can turn you guys, Michael. We can turn you guys down. You're on you're on our speakers, so uh, we can turn you down. But I will just quickly introduce our guests. Um, and Nick Sly, if you're watching out there in virtual world, we're trying to contact you, but um, not able to. So we we send you an invitation. Hopefully, you'll get it to the hangout. Um, but we do have two uh, two guests with us virtually. We have. Uh, this is Rachel Yenshevsky on the um, big screen right there at the moment. And Rachel is in Minneapolis. Hello. Hello. And then uh, next to her hey. on the bottom is Michael Rode. Uh, and Michael is in Chicago. Hello, Michael. Hello. Uh, and, and, and Michael has to has to leave uh, within a, probably within an hour. So that's the other reason I'm just kind of trying to keep us a little bit on schedule. We're, we're <laughs> behind, so that's good. But first, we're going to begin with Lizzie Watt. And uh, Lizzie has a has a has her own sort of um, performance Thanks. project. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Her own thing. Okay, so I would like to build on um, uh, where, we, where I mean, we left sorry. off. Oh, well, very very quickly, we we're now being joined by Nick Sly uh, in the middle, and Nick is coming in from New Orleans. And Nick, if you didn't hear, we have uh, we're just going to begin the session with Lizzie Watt uh, when her thing. Okay, so wonderful. Hi, people. Hello. Um, I would love to build on what we were just talking about and get in our bodies a little bit. So I have I have a provocational statementy kind of performancey thing. But I would love people to take uh, the floor. So you don't have to, you're welcome to stay in a chair, but if you want to lay down, um, sit down, fill in the space. I don't need much room, I like to walk around while I talk. I don't need you to look at me. You can look at me if you want. But I just want us to be able to be uh, actually listen with our bodies and not with our eyeballs, just right here. So, yeah. Feel free to move too if you feel like. Um, I don't like this spot anymore. I'm moving somewhere else. I need to go listen. I need to listen to this while looking outside. Whatever. So, um, I have an MFA at Naropa in the um, Contemporary Performance Program, and. Steve Wong, who taught uh, psychophysical acting there, basically pulled me under his wing, and because he was ready to be done teaching, um, slowly forced me in a beautiful way to become the person teaching his work. So, and, and slowly I started taking over his classes and assisting him on every project he did, and it was a wonderful thing. Um, I've, uh, since then, I've um, been guest faculty at Naropa, and guest faculty at ETW. And I have a theater company in Boulder that I recently left. I've been living here about a year. And I'm a performer. And I had initially thought of today that I would, I would craft this incredible performance of some kind. <laughs> uh, put my words into the body. And, be, and then I realized I'm, I'm reading this amazing book by a woman named Bobette Buster who um, writes about story, and I realized what I'd really like to do is just talk to you, tell my story, and talk to you before I put it into kind of a performance world. And I'm, I'm going to speak today uh, from the voice and body of a performer and a mother mm. of two little children. And I, I think Many of you saw them. I felt like it was really important that you all, that a lot of you got to see, lay eyes on them today, because they're not, in theory, they're really real. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted that to be a part of today. Um, so, I've been inventing children since I was about three. 
and by age nine, I was determined to have seven children. <laughs> I didn't think about career and money or even like following my intellectual and curiosity-driven passion because living in the woods where I grew up and being allowed to guide my own education through homeschooling was a purely creative setting in which I took for granted that I would always be able to live artfully that I would always be able to cultivate beauty and use my skills towards the bettering of the world around me. There were no limits to my ideas of motherhood. And most of my imaginings took me wandering the woods with my imaginary pack of kids trundling along behind me, the bigs taking care of the littles, and the eight of us singing our way through the ups and downs of finding food and shelter and adventure. Yes. Charlie Bucket and Maria Von Trapp greatly influenced my dad. <laughs> um, seven years ago, I made a real one, a real boy. And here's a perhaps unknown fact. The nuclear family can be a really lonely place. A terrible estrangement can happen if it's assumed that a parent no longer needs community because she or he has a spouse and a child. I was in Boulder, Colorado in a theater community where in a large collection of mostly 20, 30 somethings, no one had children. Or not, there were many, I didn't see them about much. And many didn't even have partners. A few of my friends could really relate to what was happening to me in my transformation. So, well not so, I, 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 assu I assumed I was always going to do this. I, I brought him, I brought Oliver into that world. And my theater company graciously, amazingly, beautifully took me and my child as a part, as the whole package. And that became our, our world. Was, what do we do with having this other little human here? I brought him to shows, he was in the sling, and dinner parties, and fundraisers, performances, rehearsals, even in physical training sessions, I'm doing Suzuki with him on my chest. Um, when he was hungry, I nursed him, when he was awake and happy, I handed him off to someone. <laughs> <laughs> and when he was four and a half weeks old, I, I got a call from the William Inn Center asking me if I could come to Kansas to work on a play for a week. And I hesitated for about three seconds because I thought, I'm a brand new mom. And then I just said, yeah, here, here we go, yeah. I, uh, I'll have my newborn with me in rehearsals. OK, OK. And off I went. So then a month ago, a month, maybe a month and a half ago, I got wind of this um, gathering that was going to happen. And I just felt like I have to submit something. And when I was thinking about what I should submit, I read this quote um, Todd, that Todd London, where he's discussing ensemble, as a history of experiment, not a form, but a process, practice and process. How we collaborate and care for one another, how we interact with community. My position as an artist parent presents a particular opportunity to take a hand in shaping the experiment from a specific point of view my point of view. I make a call to all of you for a collective recognition that the desire for, and sometimes eventuality, of offspring, and thus the existence of mothers and fathers in our ensembles, can and should be a topic of conversation, and a reality not lovingly or forcibly kept on the periphery, but embraced as a part of the ensemble's practical, functioning, and creative zeitgeist. This is a suggestion that the inclusion of offspring in the well of our creative energies can transform the meta-narrative from which we work. This is an enticement for solidarity. <laughs> this is a proclamation in defense of sanity. Can an artist parent, and in my case a single artist parent, function both as a working performance maker and as an adventuresome, engaged, creative mother and father? How can an ensemble support and champion the parents in the group? How can we raise our children inside of and 
and uh, as a part of our performance events, our studio time, and the seemingly necessary temporary neuroses that seems to come up at some point in the creative act. And within a culture that enjoys the idea of children but often turns up their nose at their disruptive and loud presences, how can we as the open-hearted champions of expression embrace the presence of our own people? I've long, I'm also highly invested in raising children that we like. <laughs> so with that in mind, I've long admired the, the idea of the circus family as I was first introduced to it in St. Louis with the Circus Flora, which is this long, this beautiful, long standing circus. And one of the, um, they have a family, the family Walenda, who are high wire act, and they, you know, the children grow up learning to walk on the wire. And um, the idea that I witness is that children are around, they watch, they learn, and they edge into participation little by little. The idea that their bodies and their minds can be engaged not by constantly putting them away from us in classes and giving them very focused attention, but by keeping them close and alternately engaging with them one-on-one -on -one with the intensity that that provides and ignoring them sufficiently so that they can muck around and find their own passions. I'm also part of the Wyandotte Nation of Kansas and the way that the Wyandotte drum circle works is that children are welcome to join in as long as they're in rhythm with the music. If not, they're just gently and firmly pushed out of the circle. Listen, says that push. Wait, listen. Your effort is good, but the music is important. So what do we do about what feels for some to be a biological imperative? And how can that desire live beside and with the equally intense desire to train to work with an ensemble and make performance? And how do we raise these really wonderful children that we want to be around? Motherhood has shaken my world to the core. It's left me breathless. It's left me in a heap. It has energized me to do things I never would have done before. It has stolen every ounce of energy I had. I know that now that there are a hundred words for love. Words that haven't even been invented yet because they're like flashes of lightning and what parent has enough time to lasso lightning? There's the love that watches from afar and yearns to be closer. There's the love that watches from afar and gently waves goodbye. There's the love that thrusts the baby birds out of their comfy nests. There's the love that's contained in the smell of a daughter's warm neck. There's the love seed that burns so hard and bright it looks like fury and can generate unbelievable, unearthly, animalistic sounds out of my mouth. It might even frighten you guys. <laughs> There's the love that spawns deep fear and pain because with love, with this kind of love, is the possibility and the promise of heartbreaking loss sometimes on a daily basis. And so there's this. When I became a mother, I landed in the most fertile arena of my life, a place of such danger, delicious danger, in between rich power and the depths of vulnerability. I feel now ready to tackle anything. I'm ready to do that lady to Beth, I'm ready to play a lecturer, I'm ready to finish the play I'm writing, I'm ready to experiment with the forms I teach, I'm ready to be in the room with you guys. But I, I cannot do my work in the way that I used to be able to work. Because I got these little guys. This is not a complaint. Please don't think that this is a complaint. This is my conundrum, this is my impasse, and I wouldn't want it any other way. Every day that I choose my children, 
and will stay at home mostly and I piecemeal work together so that I can do that. Every day that I choose to do that and not the job that will more reliably pay the bills, I'm choosing to cultivate this richly creative territory. And I'm also choosing to give up my work both on a daily basis. The theater is overwhelmingly a place of single men and women, and as those men and women grow and change into couples and parents, we outgrow the very structures we've helped create. Our innovative and creative field succumbs to the widespread American way, which doesn't know how to incorporate and welcome this new entity called parent back into its fold. We bracket. We draw lines between our home life and our work life. We create a world where we live in failure every day. There is, there's a certain understanding for mothers that they're going to step out and be with their infant for a while. But it's, it, it feels to be always at the expense of work. It's a brief lull allowed by the system until the woman returns to work and is expected to carry on at full capacity. And this is just no longer possible. We don't really want it to be that they return to be the same person they were before. I know there are, there are super moms out there. I've been called one before. You know, how do you do it? You, you're able to go teach here. You're able to keep working. You can do it all. Amazing. <laughs> but it's really, it's really not like that. It's, there's damage being done. The sense of failure and overwhelm can be crushing. Getting to this weekend's events, for instance, was a small miracle and did not happen out of me alone. My, my brother is with my children. Yesterday, my friend was with my children. There are so many amazing ideas that have been happening this past couple days. When I started, even by the end of yesterday, I was like, I'm, I'm craving practical solutions. I want to be doing something. I'm really ready. I have so much energy to start making some small shifts in our world. Um, and this, this woman, Bobette Buster, this book I'm reading, she says, instead of getting discouraged and hopeless about the system and all that seems vast and unshakable, start a small shift that people will discover to be appealing and let it catch on and slowly be indispensable in the society. So I've mentioned a couple of models that I've learned from. A month and a half ago, I, um, I started capoeira classes with my two kids, and I discovered another one. So Inez takes class for half an hour with the little kids, and then Oliver takes class with the big kids, while at the same time, the parents are taking class outside. We're all there, we're all being fed, we're all in our bodies, and the you know, Inez, when, when, the, when Oliver and I are working, Inez is just running around, or she'll, she's laying down taking a nap, or just staring, or she'll come in my arms, and I'll do my best to do the Django with her in my arms. And then at the end of the kids' class, the, often the adults are in a circle, they invite the kids to come out, and it, the, the whole circle plays together, and the adults are guides for the children. The children are having a chance to, to work with movers who have been doing this form for years and years and years and years. It's beautiful. Kids are stumbling and the adults are just pulling them along. Come on. You're coming in now. You're coming in. No one fusses. I, I've been amazed. And I'm not lying. I would tell the truth. But nobody, no kids fuss there, complain, whine. And no one plays on an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing to me. And now that I've seen it in action, I'm, I'm determined that we can make our world look more like that. So one last image. Uh, I'm eight months and three weeks pregnant with my second baby. And I'm in rehearsal for Charles Mee's play Big Love. Three hours working in a violently passionate physical fury on the final scene of the play. And then rehearsal's over, and we're sitting in a circle at the close of rehearsal, and I feel this odd thing happening in my belly, like this stretching that's going on. Okay, that's happening. That was funny. Not a complete surprise when a couple hours later I wake up in the beginning of labor, and six hours later I give birth to my daughter in my bedroom in the tub. Amazing. 
And then three weeks later, I'm back in rehearsal, and she's on my chest, and I'm working on my scenes. Or she's in the arms of Carol Katz, who was in the show with me, part of my community. And Carol would march her around the space. She, Carol said to me, give her to me. I want you to be able to do this. And she would march around the space. <laughs> <laughs> we were in it, singing to her, chanting to her. It was the most amazing gift to me, to, to have my community say to me, yes, we want you on stage. And I will take this part of you and keep it close so that you can do your work. Now, I've had occasion to wonder, though I only asked Carol about it recently, what was it like for you? See, I had this hunch that the act of entrusting her with my newborn daughter was its own kind of gift. From the pride in her voice and the daily proclamation every time she would see Inez, she'd go, where's my girl? <laughs> Claiming her. I think that hunch is right. In the same way that we gift a partner or a friend with sharing our own vulnerability, even when we may be terrified to do so, we gift our community by sharing our children. We talked yesterday about survival, sustainability, working from a place of gratitude and generosity. I think part of that is speaking our stories about how we as individuals are figuring it out or we're trying to figure it out. We can shift this model so that our children are not asking the same questions, they're not having the same battles, that they're growing up inside of healthy structures that they really can believe. So there's a lot, a lot of there, a lot there uh, about this, uh, <laughs> this session. Yeah, thanks. I'll just be the man and follow that. Uh, so so uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, really, this this session is kind of called uh, collectively the American landscape, and I don't think you can get a better definition of landscape than than all the many images you just gave us and uh, the notions of community and network and this beautiful sharing. I mean, it starts, as we've been saying all, all weekend, right? Is it, is it starts locally, starts in this room, it goes in there, starts in, in those rooms in there, those solitary people Skyping into us to, to build the networks and communities to help each other. And we've been having um, more like round table conversations, I feel, the, this weekend. And this one's a bit more, I call a mosaic, because it really is a, a number of voices to try to get bits and bobs of that a, a landscape to make some sense. Um, I also am, am very aware that Michael partly needs to leave because of his children. So I don't know if, if you want to respond to that, Michael, or if that's, that's uh, not something you want to speak to at the moment. <laughs> I, try, I thought about going into the other room and bringing my daughter and oh, okay. for a second just to listen some, but uh, that would be a disaster for what's happening in the other room, so I didn't do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I, I, if it's okay, I'd love to listen for a few more minutes. Absolutely. And then, you know, I have to go at four thirty your time. Maybe I can just grab a few minutes right before that and share some thoughts. Absolutely, that'd be great. Um, Thank you. Uh, so, so yes. Yeah, so, how am I? How am I going to follow this? <laughs> so does anybody? Does anybody else uh, in the mosaic feel like they they want to? They, they want to respond with their own work to, to what Lizzie was just saying. I'm going to just very really briefly that running an ensemble. Uh, one of my uh, company became pregnant recently and, and has had a child this year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> so happy. It totally changed the work. It was, it was that. Hey, Brian, we can't hear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't fucking speak. I'm crying. Um, it changed the work in ways that was just extraordinary whole thing's going, yes, there's a life here that's just not been there. <laughs> so, so John was teaching a workshop in Lesbos and, and one of his company members gave, gave birth while they were there and, and he's trying to, uh, he's expressing very, very succinctly but not very loudly his feelings <laughs> about, about that. Uh, Gleason, please. I, I just want to point a finger given the a previous and kind of wrapping back to a previous
previous conversation um, when we were talking about diversity within the ensemble and mm -hmm. you know the, the whiteness of this particular group and also um, being aware of the many images that that Lizzie brought to the table being from um, non-white culture mm -hmm. and also my own sort of experience through my partner of um, other cultures being more in their body oftentimes mm -hmm. and being more community based and I just I just want to throw that out there that there's also something really to be gained I think from other cultures and how they incorporate their children how the community is larger and more connected and more here and this is more acceptable and I don't have to pretend that this isn't happening mm -hmm. When I, um, I'm probably going to cry because of today I took my 18 year old son to college. <laughs> and um, a beautiful, beautiful young man. <laughs> um, and my partner, Rose Cortino, partner in my company, knows him well and, and helped raise him with my, my husband and my community. And, um, but I just want to say that it's possible to have a community that embraces, you have to make that community. That's, that's ultimately what happened for me. Because my, my academic community didn't really embrace it. I had to hide my pregnancy when I was, uh, because I was up for a position and I was afraid because hardly anyone at my institution at the time had children. In fact, about 95% of the women didn't have children because they had to make a choice between their practice and having a family or having a child. And I was afraid that if, if they knew I was pregnant, I'd be, I'd be crossed off the short list. Mm -hmm. And so I hid my pregnancy and ultimately I got the job and towards the end I couldn't hide the pregnancy. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, it was interesting because the dean at, at the time was a man and he was one of the few faculty that had children and he he actually, you know, embraced it and said, you know, you need to take time off after this child comes because you need to you know, he didn't push me to come right back into the classroom and, you know. But I had already had, you know, by way of saying that, that, that I had founded a company in, in 1988, which is the company about productions. We're in our 25th year, and Rose Portillo was here with me, came into the company in 1992. So the company had already been created. But I realize now that partially that creation was so that I could have a world at home. A home that my 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 artistic family would embrace, and of course my immediate family. You know, everything is sort of a creation. How can I make a world that is? And to me, it goes back to Amer Americanism and collectivity. And and I want Rose to read something that we brought that came out of some research that we're we're working on right now. But this notion that. Um, how can my work be a manifestation of how I want the world to be? And how can it be a reflection of my politics? Of, of, of you know, and I could go on and on about that, but, but because we're talking about American and, and the collective, that was sort of the focus of our provocations. Just how can our artistic, the world, does it reflect our politics? Does it, we want the world to be a better place. We want, we think, some of the structures of the world are damaged or, or don't respond to, to the needs of community or whatever, right? We could go on and on about that. But how in our world can we create a democratic space, a, a space where people are valued, where their voices are valued, where creativity is shared, where everyone gets credit for the work mm -hmm. that they bring into the center of this artistic process? All these wonderful utopian ideas. And, and Rose and I have tried to build, along with a bunch of other people, a utopian space that fails all the time mm -hmm. because it, it is utopian. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but with that, because I only have seven minutes, right? Um, <laughs> but Rose and I, along with some other collaborators, we're an ensemble of creators. We build original interdisciplinary theater works from the ground up. We're in our twenty fifth year. We're based here in LA. We don't have our own theater, so we have have the possibility of putting ourselves in different geographies around LA County, around California, around the nation, without having the real estate 
a you know monkey on our backs, which both is plus has pluses and minuses. But anyway, we're working on a piece right now called Evangeline the Queen of Make Believe, which is about it's set in nineteen sixty eight. And I don't need to explain 1968, I don't think this group, <laughs> the significance of it. But it's set in East LA about a young girl who's coming of age. She's just out of high school. And she's a devoted daughter by day and a Hollywood go-go dancer by night. So she's crossing borders. She's trying to break out of her, of her, of the, in a sense, the, 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 help me if I'm for anything. You know, the, uh, you know the, the cultural traps of what she's supposed to and so we're, it's, you know, we're, we're old enough to know what 1968 was like and what it looked like. <laughs> yes, we are. Oh, but, 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 <laughs> even though I don't look like it, no, I'm just I are. No, we, I grew up in the 60s, so I'm a child of the 60s. I thought, I thought that everything, by the time I got to be an adult, that, oh my God, the world is gonna be fixed. Yes. We're fixing it now. Can you imagine, of course, by 1972 and Watergate and all the rest of it, you know, I could see that it was imploding and it was not necessarily going to be going always in a progressive direction. But that said, I think that that sort of heart was brought into the creation of the company, you know. How can we sort of, not in sort of a, of a, of a sentimental way, <coughs> in a real productive way, how can we pick up from the dream of that period and make this work. So we were making, we never called an ensemble, we were always collaborative. We've done so many collaborative projects and we were always against the grain. We didn't fit in anything, you know, I mean, I could spend 20 hours on that just alone. But we kept going and kept working through. But anyway, we found this, this there's a, a book called The Strawberry Statement that was written around that period by a Columbia University student and it was made into a major feature film also, starring Elliot Gould, um, if anyone cares. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and uh, it was about, it's like almost like a diary. It was uh, a diary of, of the Columbia University. It was a blog before they were blogs. Yeah, it was a blog before they were blogs, exactly. And, and um, all about, you know, what was the angst and what was going around happening in New York at Columbia. With, with the anti-university and the napalm and Dow Chemical and all the things in Vietnam and everything was going on at the time. So, to, to, right. I'm, I'm much shorter than she is. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> it's, lo it's lovely to hear you. Your, your new voices to the teapot, so it's lovely to so hear you. So just uh, uh, a bit of inspiration for, right. the, for us and maybe for you. There used to be a dream for America. You know, the American dream? America was going to be different. Free, good, free and good. Of course, they blew it right away. As soon as the Puritans came over, they set up religious laws. But at least they clung to the dream until now. Now, no one hopes for America to be different. I guess it was the dream that ruined the dream. People became convinced it was true, so they never made it true. People think the USA, a great sounding, nice and formal name, is special. So we can do anything and it's okay. An American expression. People should wake up and dream again. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Utopia and, and failure are, are, as you said, essential. They're, they're, they're necessary. There's a, there's a really lovely scholar I was tweeting about this the other day on uh, The Howl, on The Weekly Howl, about um, there's a, uh, uh, an English scholar named Ruth Levitas who writes about uh, utopia, and she, um, she writes that failure is absolutely necessary for, for utopia, but, but utopia is absolutely necessary for society in order to keep uh, moving forward in a hopeful manner and to keep building new models and to keep generating that. And that's, that's what I'm hearing from everything that's been said in the last 20, 35 minutes, is, um, is it like you know, raising children that you like <laughs> uh, is, is, is a utopic yeah. adventure, and I'm sure there are times where you must feel it fails. And yet, then you have this amazing story with Carol, where um, you know, I mean, the, that is the community raising, raising that child. Um, and and 
So I'm kind of wondering again if Michael or, or Nick want to jump in here because there's definitely themes that I would feel resonate with, with your work and, and it can be in a sharing of just, you know, Nick, if you want to explain what you've been doing, you know, to, to, don't feel like it is a mosaic again in this session. Don't feel like we have to connect the threads. Uh -oh. oh, Nick, I think we might not be able to see you. Hold on. Uh-oh. They can't hear me. That's a shame because he's got a lovely voice. <laughs> oh. Can we just... Nick, are you yeah. trying to speak and we can't hear you? Yes, he is. Okay. Can you so type? There, there may be a thing on what? Hangout where the bar above says that you were typing and so we, ch we muted you. I noticed that Hangout does that sometimes. Oh. oh, so many things to come out of that beautiful head waiting. Oh. <laughs> Can somebody read the mouse and just, uh, you know? Oh, is there a lip reader in the house? <laughs> no. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, well, while we're waiting for Nick with, with, uh, to figure out technical difficulties and just keep trying, Nick, if you can, or perhaps that's it, um, uh, does anybody else feel like responding? Uh, Theater Plastique. I know you're a, you're a very new company, but do you do you feel, in some ways, your 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 work is speaking to this kind of collectivity, or do you do you want to jump in here? Or no? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, we wanted to talk about um, being women doing this work. Mm -hmm. um, so right. I think. <laughs> And Michael, can you hear Michelle okay? Yes. Okay. So we'll just show them. And when, maybe after that video, if you want, I can share a thought or two if Nick's not that. Great. Cool. So let me just introduce the video really quick in the work. Um, it's called Gertrude Stein Saints. Yes. Well, and then, okay, so we're, yes, yeah, so we're going to show the video to give you sort of an idea of the context we're coming from and where the conversation comes out of. Um, and then we were going to just start a timer and have a conversation between ourselves and then hopefully open it up after the timer goes off. Okay, great. Well, why don't we watch the video yes. and then we'll have Michael and then we'll do the timer. Cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Does that work? Yes, but yeah. let me just introduce this just really quickly. It'll take half of the minute. Um, so one of Gertrude Stein's lifelong projects was to write the sound of American spoken language. So we use American music to sort of elucidate her artistic project. And you know, of course, it's always really important for the actor to get intimate with the words, but it's very hard to do with Gertrude Stein. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, what I set up was a situation where they wrote all the music. So they wrote all the music for this work in five days, and then they memorized it over Christmas break, and then we came back and we staged it. So they used blues, rap, um, bluegrass, just all American genres of music, and we put it all together and brought it to the French, and this is the clip that we'll see. Who are they? Are they? Um, they're students at Carnegie Mellon. So this is my thesis show. Or they were in Carnegie Mellon.
Um, it, so, just in the interest of time and to, to remind us that it is a mosaic, uh, Michael, do you want to just throw some words in? I know you didn't get to see the video, so it's not responding to that. But. Well, I, I, I actually I went to Michelle's site while you were showing that, so I was looking at a muted version of the same trailer you were watching. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dramaturgical so, technology. So it looks cool. It was interesting to watch it with the sound different than what I was watching. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'll be, I'll, I'll be really quick, just the whole notion of the relationship of contemporary ensemble practice in the U.S. and the utopic impulse is something that's been on very um, explicitly on, on my mind and uh, a part of my work for, for a long time. Um, Sojourn Theater was founded in 1999, which is about 15 years old now, and one of our, one of our, one of our first projects was, um, one of our early projects was a piece called Cities on a Hill which um, actually involved us driving around the United States as we moved from the East Coast to the West Coast as a whole company. And we set up a shop in Portland, Oregon in uh, late 99, early 2000. And as we made our way across the country, we, um, we stopped all over. We were touring a show of ours, but we would ask people about the American dream. And the first piece that we made in our new home of Portland, Oregon was partly based on these encounters that we had gas stations and diners and fields and factories and all kinds of places uh, as we as we literally moved and tried to make our own little um, utopic arts community back then. So uh, the question that came out of that, and it's been a part of a lot of our work in these three projects I'll mention in a moment, super quick, was the question of um, who am I responsible for? And for me, uh, since 1991, when I founded another organization called Hope is Vital, that was doing work with uh, men and women who were uh, living with HIV and or AIDS and who were homeless uh, around the United States. I was a part of starting up ensembles for about seven or eight years, made up of men and women living in that circumstance and in that life condition and local young people. And always the question that came at the heart of the work as we took the work out into different communities, urban, uh, suburban, and rural, was always how do you engage in a democratic society with questions of communal responsibility when you're also dealing with a society that's um, also kind of prioritizing the market and um, consumption. So how do those things live alongside each other? Uh, and particularly if you're involved in educational contexts where you're teaching and in learning communities, how are you kind of reconciling the transmission of information, the building of experiences, and an acknowledgement of these different kinds of uh, conditions and systems that we're all living in. And I, I just would sort of uh, say that like right now, this question of what is ensemble in a, in a contemporary American landscape is, uh, is super connected for me to asking the question, okay, so we've got this project called How to End Poverty in 90 Minutes that we uh, premiered in Chicago last year. And this year, there'll be versions of it seen in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and then Washington, D.C. And it's a 90-minute event where audiences basically, uh, the majority of the box office goes on stage as cash, and the audience has a period of time to determine how to use that money to attack poverty in their local community. And it's a mixture of performance spectacle and facilitated dialogue. And the notion of poverty is partly the content and partly a Trojan horse, because the real issue of the performance is how do we make a decision as 200 people about how to aim our resources towards the collective good? So I, I remain really interested in how ensemble becomes a way not just in the room where we make, but also <coughs> in the engagements that we create in community, uh, a way to actually embody and explore that question. How do we um, decide together what to do with our resources and how we are going to live together? Um, should I stop there, or should I mention these two other quick things? I want to be a responsible part of the mosaic. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm all hearing two things, yes? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. This these two other quick things that we're doing. Um, we're in the midst of a two and a half year ongoing artist and residency project with Catholic Charities USA, which is the largest poverty uh, fighting uh, organization in the U.S. and is not a part of the Catholic Church, although it is related to the Catholic Church, like distant and constantly tense cousins. 
<laughs> and we, we are actually midway through working with them at over 20 sites around the US where we give workshops on collaborative practice. We host public conversations with them around polarizing issues in communities that relate to poverty and economic disparity. And we, of course, develop encounters with people and create performance. The whole company of our, almost the whole company, a dozen of us were just in San Francisco last week where we shared a performance we built for them at their national convening. And we're about to be with them uh, in New Orleans, actually, uh, very soon. Um, and so a question for me around that work is, um, how do we engage with ideologically diverse uh, colleagues and partners in difficult and challenging conversations where we are making rigorous art, but we are also making rigorous public conversation? And that's a big part of our work at Sojourn. And maybe the third thing I would just mention is, we have a project called Islands of Milwaukee, where we're working with homebound seniors in uh, low-income contexts. And we're partnering with the Department of Public Health, the Department of Public Transit, Goodwill, the Salvation Army, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and a number of uh, social service organizations to basically spend two years uh, making visible the beneath the surface conversations about our community elders who are living trapped in their homes and how to bring their the value of them and the necessity of public conversation about them into policy discourse with local legislators. So again, we're looking at how our practice of ensemble extends to all the partners and all the contexts that we can develop together to be moving our work not just into the studio and into performance venues, but into public settings again, 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 where we're always exploring notions of who am I, who are we responsible for, and how is our practice about art making, but also about public discourse and public policy. Inspired so that's my that's my that's my thing today. I guess. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly inspiring stuff. I think it's uh, it's lovely and it's great to hear that it's out there. Um, I, I know you have to go, yes? Is there? In a, in a minute or two, but I'm, I'm gonna just listen for a little bit. I'm so sorry I haven't been with you the whole weekend. Yeah. Just to tack on to this, the talk about family, I would say I've been on the road so much lately that this was a rare weekend when I could be home with my family and we just made a choice that I, that I had to be home with my family. So that's why I'm here and not with you. I wish I was in the conversation, but it feels resonant with trying to make the decisions we're all trying to make about where our energy is and how we how we build our work. Absolutely, and Michael has been essential in, in, in helping us to organize this virtual aspect of the whole weekend. And so it's uh, we thank you for all of your support and all of your help. And we um, we thank you for making the choice to be with your family. Yeah, of course, if he has time, please do. Michael, can you hear me okay? This is Catherine. Yeah. Um, I, I have yeah. a really practical question for you. Do you ever take in student interns into your group? Because I have a student <laughs> with a great hunger to understand what applied theater is in the world, and she just woke up to the notion that it's even a phenomenon, but it was something she was yearning for, and I'm trying to direct her toward good people doing good things. Yeah, we do. We, we have summer institutes. We take uh, in terms of a project specific basis. I teach at Northwestern in the undergrad and the graduate directing program, so sometimes our apprentices and interns come out of that, but just tell them to contact me. I will, okay, that's what I wanted to check. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, of course, thanks. Great. I'm gonna just shut up and listen to Nick and Rachel and whoever, and then I'm just gonna disappear in a couple of minutes, but thanks for including me. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, and hi, Teresa, today. Super. Um, do, do, uh, do we want to return to your to your timer discussion? Is it is it something where we all we all kind of get a, get going and then we come back to Nick and Rachel? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna start the timer. Um, so, this is the timer starts. Um, so we're gonna start, uh, Michelle, by talking a little bit specifically about some things that happened to you while you were working on the project that we all saw from um, Gertrude Sciences that have to do with being a woman, woman working as a director, and then also working with gender-specific casts, right? Like it was, okay. it was a group of men and a yeah. group of women that worked separately. Yeah. OK, so the project started with Four States and Three Acts, and it was cast with all men at Carnegie Mellon. So this was the first draft of this was done inside an institution that's like 
all about mineral weekends and having answers. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, the process, it was, it was hard for a lot of it because A, I was called crazy, like behind my back, that was like the thing going around, like she is crazy. And when something is crazy, it's kind of all over the place and it doesn't have any intention, you know? And that, so they were not acknowledging that. In fact, there was intention in what I was building, the rehearsal room I was building. And then um, this other thing that kept happening is people kept saying that, I, that they were wondering if I knew what I was doing. Mm. Mm. Do you know what you're doing? Do you, are you directing? Is this what directing is supposed to look like? Because they would come <laughs> into my rehearsal room and I would just be at the table and the people would be talking and somebody's like, you know, banging their head against the, the wall over there and just kind of like a lot of chaos. But I saw a lot of work going on. And um, so I, I literally got called to like the prison's office. <laughs> and and they said, do you know? Keep your voice up. Okay. Do you know what you're doing? And, and I said, no, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's the point. Like, that is what I'm trying to tell you. Yes, you're right. I don't exactly know what I'm doing. I don't exactly know where I'm going. And that is, that's what, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're doing here. Because I feel like in an ensemble that I should not know very much in a way. Like, in a way, like, I just, for this, I just came in and it was kind of like Gertrude Stein, American music. That's all I know right now. And, but that was strong enough to take us all the way through the project. All the way down and up and down and up and down again. Um, and because if I come in somehow knowing more like what I want, then what is the point of us being together? Like I'm, I feel like I'm not creating any space for you mm -hmm. if I know what you, what I want from you. So I, it's important for me to just not know. Um, and now speaking about the gender cast, so you know when the show is cast, it's cast by a casting director at school. So you know they're like, will you take these seven extra men? And I was like, that is weird because this is Richard Stein. Sure. Let's just do that. And the music that they wrote, though, was very, like, it It was, there was always a soloist, and all the men were playing instruments with their mouths, so like a horn player. So everybody had, like, a part, right? All these men had their own special part. And then after the show uh, closed, I thought, well, that was very nice, but I want to know what the women do. And so I brought in women doing saints and singing, and their music was all together. So they always sang together in harmony, and very rarely was a woman featured as like a main singer. I thought that was very interesting. And also it just made for like a very dynamic show at the end, you know, once they brought the two shows together. So. Mm -hmm. And the unknown is something that we talk about a lot. And we talk, we talk about this, I mean, honestly, I don't really know what it means to be a woman, to be a woman working, to be a woman in the world. Like it's something that I feel like I'm writing and discovering constantly. But I feel like it makes the process, my interests, more open and available to discovery and accepting a space that is unwritten. Because you don't know. <laughs> because I don't know. Because I don't know. <laughs> and, I, and then I'm and then I'm interested in what is discovered in a place where the threads aren't quite fit together properly. Um, that it, what exists in between those spaces is as a generative energetic impulse for idea is, is really compelling to me. Um, and maybe because it's where I've lived so much of my life, um, I feel like it's a really rich site for work. When things don't fit together, yeah. <laughs> when, I mean, well, I'm well, talking about that space, you know, like, here you're going like this, but see, we think very differently. I think with, like, pictures, and she's like, words. So then I just look at her husband, and I'm like, look at that space right Well, okay, so yeah, <laughs> like, my hands in this, and what I was imagining was, like, a carpet that was very, thin, like, very loosely woven, and the space is very thin. Because <laughs> <laughs> we talked with Catherine about this, and mm -hmm. something about the space, like this kind of like that these things are not linking up, you know, and that there's something inside of this whole space. Is that what you're talking yeah. about right now? Okay. Yeah. 
opened a space this year called Catapult. And uh, it was a really big dream to open up our own space. And we thought that the process of collectively running our space and building it out together was going to be by far the easiest thing we've ever done. <laughs> and it, it turned out to be something that really, really was painful for all of us in the way of, um, I feel like, taught us um, a lot about the fact that we were, we were trying to do something that we didn't have a lot of models for. And so we just kept running up against uh, 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 all kinds of different needs. It was a very, about a five year old ensemble. Uh, we were about 10 years old. The Art Spot Productions is about 20 years old. So the process of building out this space together, doing all of the labor on it, trying to come up with collective agreements about how the space could meet all of our needs, it really reminded me that about this notion of collectivity that we really are a family. And for, for better and for worse, sometimes no one uh, treats family like family treats family. Um, but ultimately, I feel like it's brought us to a stronger place in, in our work together. And now that the space is up and running, it's completely changing our work. And I think we said it going through the process that this struggle is going to make us stronger. And it, you know, I know it's cliche, but it really has brought a depth of experience to our collective. Um, that's, that's, that's really catalyzing the work that we're doing right now. And we're, we're undertaking the largest project that we've ever done, a piece called Cry You Want. And it's a, it's a two mile processional out on this land that's disappearing in coastal Louisiana. And you know, we're not for going through that experience this year together, I don't think we would be able to be doing the amount of work that we're all doing on this project. So I, when I think of collectivity, I really, I think of, Harkening a little bit to what Teresa said, like you know, that all of my elders and the people who I stand on their shoulders, you know, those people who thought they were solving the problems, they were actually teaching us how to struggle together. And I think that that value of staying in the room and struggling together is actually the thing that creates the conditions for us to do things that are impossible. And to create the conditions for the type of world that we want to live in and the type of people that we want to be which is um, you know, inventing new things and ways of communicating. It's not easy work. And so, uh, yeah, that's what I have right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you. <laughs> hey, Teresa. Hi, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Can I add something do. real quick? Um, when I This is a fantastic topic because it really resonates with with this space and the idea that this uh, separation of life and art, and we all know in the theater world in Los Angeles, it also means the real job that pays the money for the rent, for the car, for the fuel, for the food, for everything else. So all these departmentalized aspects of our life that actually in some total do not add up to the whole, what whole can bring. And the concept that we have for this block is that of a village, um, meaning that we, we no longer split our family and our art life and our livelihood and our where we shop and what we eat and everything else. It has to have more of that total understanding that it's not you jump in the car and you go work in Santa Monica and then you have to gather your stuff there and then you see the companies downtown and you just happen to live in Pasadena, for instance, right? So we, this, this split up that I think LA is the, you, the most ubiquitous place of how split up we all are and how much resources we're wasting. We're wasting our life. I've calculated that it, on average we spend two hours a day in the car that means out of 12 months a year, six weeks oh. is spent in the car. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of my life would have been spent. So Brian and I, we returned here. We determined to find a way to develop, to have new creative developments where artists also, because we all have habits and interests and hobbies, uh, that we also creatively develop retail and commercial aspects of the village, that we are cooperatively invested in that, at, as well as our spaces in which we rehearse and we perform, and everything has to be within walking distance. Yeah. And I think that 
allows for, our, it freed up my imagination because when we just came back here from England, we, we live now around the corner from here. And that, for, for us, we no longer, our house and our theater are no longer separate, it's one. If we need to rehearse or do something and something is not happening here, we know we can do it there. If we need to host somebody there is great. If you're working really late and people uh, in the morning need to come back, they can sleep in our house. Everything, if, if, if we're hosting a big festival here and we need to find places for people to sleep, sleep, we know that we have a shower and two bathrooms over there so they can sleep in the theater and they have a home to come to in the morning to have breakfast, everything else. This is what I'm trying to, um, this is what I feel is resonating. And it's the same thing with children. So we can have collective kindergartens. And if we are having classes for adults, we can have classes, classes for children. Because I think actually children can teach us a whole lot. Um, my dog teaches me a lot. I can only imagine what a child learned to me. And it's one of the reasons Brian and I, we never engaged into having children because we couldn't figure out how this crazy setup of LA can be possibly possibly add a child because I know that then we would have plugged ourselves into needing to have jobs, real jobs that pay money in order to support this. So we want to figure out a way to change it and um, any ideas, any thoughts, any suggestions for me would be great, but of course we will have a forum for this specific subject later as some of you brought up that that is such an important matter that it requires its own around the teapot and which we will post later. And we, we're planning to go to New Orleans and visit Nick and their development. We're going to be applying for the grant to see this so we can <laughs> learn from one another and maybe not make some yes. of the mistakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And of course, this is also just the rich history of ensembles and collective creation. I mean, again, I'll go back to you know quick connotations, easy associations, but collective creation often brings up 68, brings up communi co communal living. Mm -hmm. Communal living brings up the notions of children, intergenerations, of all of this stuff. There is, there is a history there that is, on the one hand, a beautiful alternative and a beautiful parallel tradition in which to draw um, strength from, and is also something in which it is, it is uh, too easy to set it up as an opposition to the society and the mainstream dominant ways of practice. And I think what we're talking about here is the much more complex notions in which, as Nick put it, you are creating your own conditions to struggle and to live the lives we want to live, as, as Teresa and Rose and Lizzie were bringing up in terms of how you start living, you know, the utopia shapes your politics and your politics shape your living together, yeah? And, I, and that's very much what Oya is talking about, is the conditions in which we want to be living, the ways in which we see politics. That might not be the same for everybody else, and that's why I do want to bring in other voices. I know we, we have Asa and we have um, Brian Sonia Wallace and, um, and Tanya, who we got to see the, the performance in the parking lot last night. Um, and so, so perhaps maybe this, this speaks a bit with Nick's doing Cry You One um, along this, uh, it's two mile stretch, right, Nick? Yeah, this two mile stretch. Sorry, I'm muted, yeah, this two miles. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you know, so so uh, Tanya's work is is um, all is sort of site generative, as you put it yesterday, Tanya. Do you do you mm -hmm. feel like jumping in here or no? Yeah, no, I'm happy okay. to. Um, can we? Would it be rude to put up some of the stuff from the web? Absolutely. I don't want to exclude people. They can go to the websites as well. Like sure, the, absolutely. Or, uh, however, people yep. want to do it. Um, but if you know, if you know what you want to do, you can go to a so, website. Yeah, sure. and your your website is. OperaDelaspacio.org. OperaDelaspacio.org. And then there's also a, a YouTube channel, um, and I'll toggle between both sites. Um, and can you say it more time? Sure. Opera, Opera Del, O P E R A D E L E S P A C I O dot org. Um, the title. Thanks. Great. If we could pull up the, there's a YouTube channel. Well, and I think there's yeah. We have a lot right down here in YouTube there, guys. Yeah. Um, we got all the social media going on. So the title comes a uh, uh, translation, the Italian word for opera it means work. Work of the space. Um, great. And yeah, <laughs> that's the YouTube automatically starting. The work, it just works. Oh, I am Thanks. And if you can
can make that full screen <coughs> and then pull it back to the beginning. And then what was the quote that, that we were doing with Nancy Keystone this morning mm -hmm. about unknowing? Mm -hmm. all it was so, so on unknowing. Uh, so, so on unknowing. Yeah, uh, to, knowing till the end with no sight. Was that what it was? <laughs> no, there's no end in sight. No end in sight. No end in sight. No end in sight. Is that what it was, Michael? Yes. So on, unknowing there, till the end. No there, end there's no end in sight. Yes. No end in sight. Yes. Kind yes. of yes. another thing. Theater of searches that we brought up yes. yesterday. Wendell Beaver's provocation about um, where can there be deep diving within institutions? The unknowing of of uh, that you were bringing up of what it is to be a woman, the unknowing of being the director in the room, the unknowing of uh, of actors thinking that their director is probably crazy, the unknowing, <laughs> of, <laughs> the unknowing of, of, of a mother it, wanting to continue in this work, the unknowing of the work wanting to support a mother, right? It's all searching, yeah? and it does seem to be without ending. <laughs> so I was just filling. I'm just. I'm just. I'm just going. Yeah, I'm ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. So uh, what I've asked to happen is that there's going to be a video playing in the background while I'm talking. I've just pulled the volume down a bit so you can toggle in between my voice and the images. Um, and instead of talking about what we do, I'm actually interested in talking about how we do it as an ensemble. Um, one of the challenges that keeps coming up is the desire to have the communal living and that group of people are completely dedicated to each other 24-7 and that's just not possible and over the many years of making work and committing, asking people to commit a great deal of themselves to the work and then me intrinsically trying to give them as everything I can, people leave and move on. In the beginning when I was young I got angry mm -hmm. and I didn't respond well. And I had to learn to let go of that and accept that people are going to come and go. That's part of the journey. And I needed to learn how to be gracious and supportive of that. And allow instead that it be not a strict ensemble, but a network. A network of people who are really interested in this work, <laughs> interested in the vocabulary, interested in the community, but realistically have other things they want to do as well as artists and as people. And so what I've tried to do is set it up so that people who are interested will come and train initially, kind of get to know people, people who have been with me for a while, kind of get a sense of the other person, how does it feel. And then I'll say, okay, I'm gonna work on a project and it's gonna be three months of your life and it's gonna be really intense and you're gonna to have to figure out your job situation and your money situation if you wanna be a part of this. And I give people plenty of time in advance. So everybody says, I'm in, I'm not in. I need a break from you. I need a break from the group. I'm going to go work in Disney for a while, whatever. Huh? And so then we begin. And then for those three or three to six months, whatever that project is, I'm expecting a full commitment. And I will give back that full commitment as well. And at the end of that six months, we all take a break from each other and go, OK. Maybe a month or two later, we'll come back and say, all right, we'll start some training again, see if we want to open it up to more people, who's in town, what's going on. People who've been with us for a while uh, will send me emails and say, hey, I want to come back. And I'll say, okay, great. We're in the midst of something. It's not a good time. In three or four months, we'll be opening it up again. And so we just came out of, uh, we did a big project last spring, and over the summer, we had a project that got canceled. The producers didn't have their act together, and I had decided that it wasn't good to bring the company into it. That was painful, but ultimately, everyone in the company thanked me. Um, and so we're going to be opening it up again, and I've met some people in the rooms who I know from other places, and I've said, you know, you might want to think about maybe checking this out. We have a new project coming up in January. It's a new opera, working with the composer and the librettist. The librettist is a company member. Um, and we have been lucky enough, through my association with Cal State, to become a company in residency. Um, we have a dean and a chair who are very supportive. Um, but I think the biggest thing has been, you know, because people always ask me, well, how many people in your company? I'm like, I, who's there this week? Or, you know, <laughs> how many people are in this show right now? That's who it is. Um, 
the questions that were raised, uh, Brian gave me the book, I asked to look at the book before we did the piece out in the parking lot because I wanted to see if there was text from there that we wanted to incorporate. Um, and the question of, you know, what do we mean by ensemble? And uh, whenever people ask, you know, it, uh, that notion of ensemble for me really is who's in the room right now. And like was being mentioned by many people, it's what each person brings into the room. I have a concept, I have an idea, I have something I'm interested in, and if people in the network are interested in that, they'll come and join and dedicate themselves to that. If they're not, they're like, nah, that doesn't interest me. Sometimes things come because company members will be like, you know, we've only been doing this street stuff now and I'm really bored, can we do a text piece? Sure, let's do a text piece. You know, and then a script will appear or something will be created collectively. And then after three months, six months of that, everyone's like, yeah, let's go back and do Art Walk again. I'm like, all right, we'll go back and do Art Walk. Um, Art Walk's been a great discovery. This is Meet Me at Metro um, that was done for a number of years. Um, but we, we started doing the Art Walks and we were surprised how, um, great things, can we go to the website now? We were surprised that there were no performers at Art Walk. There's a lot of music, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of galleries. And there's not a lot of live performance happening. And so we would just show up at, at street corners. Um, and you see this? Zoom in. How do we zoom into just like this text here? Make it a little bigger. Um, so we would just show up at street corners and perform viewpoints based site generated work. And then drunk people would join us. We're like, this is awesome. I want to join. How cool is that? And we figured, you know, there's got to be something about what we're doing that drunk people feel like it's okay to join us. Um, part of the reason we got the Meet Me at Metro is we just did some gorilla stuff on the Metro one day. And we got caught. You know, uh, we get in trouble a lot with the police in Pasadena and Colorado. Um, but we just tell them, you know, we're doing performance art, and they just say, okay, please do that somewhere else. <laughs> um, <laughs> but every one of these places, non-performers wanted to join in, and I just thought that was really lovely, and I, and I compliment the group every time that happens, that there's something right about what they're doing, that it doesn't feel exclusive, but it feels welcoming. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about what we do. There's you know, the social media up the wazoo, but I felt that it was more important to share about how, how we're working through. Absolutely. Again, it's that, uh, go back to what we were talking about yesterday, uh, the notions of ensemble that are, that are in encountering ensemble, and the, the, the very um, the almost trite definitions that, that John uh, hints at at the beginning of his book, where ensemble is just a long-standing company of actors. Um, and and, and you're, you're obviously, um, Tanya mentioning uh, the similar issue. It has nothing to do with the amount of people or the group of people that are with you at the moment. It has more to do with the work that you're sharing with each other and then trying to share with other people uh, in, in a community that's not in, you know, as we are right now, in a nice 99 seat black box theater. And, and perhaps that maybe leads into to, to you, Brian, if you want to sure. share, I'm mean, no pressure if you don't. Yeah, no, I do. Um, can I ask, first of all, that everyone just come closer and shift where you are in the space of it. <laughs> just come on closer. You can bring chairs if you like. You don't have to sit on the floor. I know people have been sitting on the floor for a while, but just come on in closer. Anything closer than that. Get, get comfortable with each other. We've been here for a couple of days. <laughs> there we go. Come on in. Okay. Well, sit or stand or, or whatever it may be. Cool. Thank you. So um, I tend to work a lot. I'll, I'll try to, to speak to what everybody said. Um, Hello. Uh, <laughs> I tend to work um, a lot as a theater of the oppressed practitioner or uh, applied theater as the less scary uh, version is called um, that you're allowed to do at things like colleges, uh, which Michael was, was kind of hinting at that work where it interacts a lot with policy and interacts a lot with kind of the lived experiences of people in their lives and trying to bring theater to that. Um, and what I just did is how most of Boal would start every workshop. He would make everyone come closer. He would make them make that choice to engage or not. Um, and so I don't have particular things that I'm gonna say. I'm gonna couch it in the framework of the last project that I did, uh, which was in an affordable housing 
unit in Boyle Heights um, with a mix of sort of uh, Mexican immigrant parents, low income Chicano kids who've grown up all of their lives in the States, uh, you know, women with babies nursing as they're doing scenes, that kind of thing. Um, so it kind of relates to, to what we've been talking about. And I just want to share some unknowings with you guys uh, and invite you to respond. So I think it, it relates to the idea of uh, family within an ensemble, and, and this is actually going to families and saying, will you become an ensemble? So that was my first kind of thought about this, was what you're doing isn't saying, I'm looking for actors, and then we're going to form this sort of community based on the fact that we all like this thing. You're going to people, and you're saying, hey, I want to work with this community. And often what I found in doing this work is you get families, and you get, especially within the Latino community, it's cousins and grandparents and kids, and you don't necessarily even know that they're related, but you realize you're like, oh, I've been working in kind of two extended families through this entire work, and I've you know been working with this community and really getting the whole community. Up. No, you're working with two families, mm -hmm. um, and that's great in a way because what you're doing is you're not coming in and saying, you know, I am a hegemonic white dude, and I'm going to come speak Spanish at you for three months and then leave. Uh, you're saying, look, you're already a family. I'm coming in and I'm bringing this thing, I'm bringing this training, I'm bringing something that I want to offer you. Maybe you're already an ensemble. Maybe you're already, you're already this community. I don't have to make you a community. I'm trying to bring some techniques in. And, and more than that, just say, hey, you guys want to talk, what do you want to talk about? And here's a framework for how we can talk about that. Um, and that's kind of interesting. I talked to a friend who I, I did a long four-month project in Ecuador with that was around theater of the oppressed uh, with oil drilling in an indigenous community. Um, and he totally rejected that. He said, that's bullshit. Um, and what theater of the oppressed tends to do is you go and you group people based on these sort of tertiary aspects. So you're saying, oh, you're all the same because uh, you're indigenous, because you live in this community because you live in this uh, housing complex. And that's not really what's the most important to people. That's something that we can point to very visibly and say, oh yes, this is your unifying factor. But to say that that is a pre-existing community and they exist before and they exist after isn't necessarily true. And so there is an element maybe of creating that ensemble work, of making a community even within what we have this preconceived notion of being existing communities. Um, and there's something in there as well, what I wrote down is, is family within an ensemble versus the family as an ensemble. Um, as well, I think it has to do with that idea of separation of life and art. Um, are we building a village? Are we coming into a village that's pre-existing? Um, I've done a lot of community development work and a lot of that talk is gentrification and that's something that's going on in Hollywood to a massive degree. And so I think it's an important question to raise that, you know, is it a good idea for Hollywood to become and not all of Hollywood, but for this artist's village, who is that displacing? Who are the people who are here now? How are they served by the work that's going on? Can we serve them better with the work that's going on? Or is this something where we're saying, well, you know, we work here, so we want to live here too, so you guys can go, go up to Pasadena. You guys can go elsewhere. Um, and that's something that I think is, is an issue as artists that we need to not be afraid of and to be politically engaged with how the spaces that we're in and the work that we're doing are affecting the people who already live there. And we have these great ideas and there's a space to, to invite people as well. Um, so those are some things, uh, some questions. I think that it, it is interesting, the idea of ensemble just being, as someone was saying in, in the intro of your book, you mentioned kind of almost facetiously, just an issue of time, just an issue of spending time together. It's interesting to see coming out of this work, people going on and doing other theater projects, people going on, uh, you know, the, the housing complex I work with, like the kids all played basketball together, and that's what they did. And that playing basketball, we played a lot of sound ball in the work, and so you'd see them playing sound ball and then also playing basketball. And so it just kind of entered the lexicon, sound ball being like, whoo, when you pass the sound around. Um, <laughs> I saw Thank your you. face, right? <laughs> so like, it kind of, kind of enters the lexicon of their play. It isn't necessarily a thing of, and now we are doing theater. It becomes a thing of, okay, and this is, this is another thing that people know about now. Um, and it's something where I think a lot of times theater of the oppressed, and any time you have sort of uh, 
instructor and instructed, particularly where there are class differences, uh, national differences, race differences, et cetera, et cetera, um, the idea of invitation is really important. And also the idea of kind of a little bit what you were talking about. You're, you're sort of inviting people to join in and to respond and to give their own thing, but you're not necessarily forcing something onto them. Um, and I'll say kind of one, one more thing, I think, and that's the idea that in a lot of Boal's work, the kind of point of it, the meat of it, is that there isn't an audience and actors. And that he talks about the idea of spect actors, which is you present maybe a short scene that reflects the community's issues as you've talked to them, probably as community members performing, and then you say to everyone, right, so this is a problem, let's talk about that problem, okay. Now how do we solve that? Don't tell me, get up and act in this scene. Get up and make your own scene in response. Show us the solution. Show us the image of the problem and the image of the solution. He talks in that language a lot. And it's an idea that I think is something that's interesting and to be explored, uh, where we've talked a lot about ensemble in the last two days, but I, we haven't really talked about audience and how audience fits into ensemble. And we have regulars, and we have donors, and we have supporters, and we have relationships with audience members. And that's something that I think, you know, coming out of a lot of the Eastern uh, European schools and all of that, like, we're very conscious of in some ways. Um, but it's definitely a question that I have, particularly in work where you're asking, you're going into a community, you're kind of separating out actors and audience, but then you're asking them not to be separate. And that community is something that goes on to your work and continues after, and they're kind of their own ensemble. So I think my question to all of you is how can the audience, what we think of as the audience, be part of that ensemble? How do you create a micro ensemble within the space of a performance? Again, the idea of time maybe enters into that. Um, you know, you have two hours, make an ensemble go. How does that work? Those are my unknowns. Thank you. Anybody feel like responding or shall we, shall we Yeah? We, I know we're getting we're getting to the end of a long <laughs> weekend <laughs> and, and I'm really aware of that. So we should take a keep keep breaking. Uh, well we we're, 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 we're really almost done. We still have yeah. Rachel on, on viral, so if anybody needs to use the show, please do. Um, uh, Rachel, I, I just want to bring in your voice because you've been so, uh, so you a lovely, beautiful face there for us, but we haven't gotten to see, to see you speak. Um, and uh, I, I just want to give you a chance to, to respond in any way you Are want you or to share you? some of your thoughts on collaboration. Oh, no, there is. Oh. Uh, uh, and, and maybe just identify who you are for anybody who doesn't know who you are in the room. Sure, sure. Um, hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Very surreal experience watching in this way, and particularly thinking about um, collectivity in this collection, but from afar. <laughs> and it's it's uh, appropriate somehow because I'm a I'm a playwright and performance maker. <laughs> um, I work in a lot of different ways. I experiment a lot with my writing. I'm not part of an ensemble right now or, or any kind of set collective. I collaborate with ensembles a lot. Um, but so, so I gravitate towards these kinds of gatherings because I love um, collaborative performance making. Um, but it feels kind of meta to be <laughs> in this conversation, but like out of, out of it, you know, literally Absolutely. miles away. I'm in Minneapolis. Um, but so, you know, all of this is just making me think of the word paradox and how um, what I gravitate towards in performance making are these sort of contradictory things of, of needing, um, like wanting to be in that practice of collaboration, but also um, finding myself as kind of a floater for the most part, um, geographically and otherwise. Um, but, but needing both, needing to be bouncing between them um, and not sinking too far into one only. Um, and you know, the, the beautiful performance at the beginning, I just was like, oh, I just want to throw everything. I'm thinking about the window and think about children. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm, 
it's something that's on my mind a lot in terms of someone who would very much like children one day and the clock is ticking, um, but not knowing how to, um, not yet being able to financially sustain that in the practice that I'm pursuing. Um, so structures, structures for organizations, for ensembles are something I'm very much searching for um, sustainable ones. And I gather some of that has come up in your earlier conversations. I'm sorry, I haven't been able to tune into everything. But um, you know, I'm very interested in what models you all are finding out there that have been sustainable for you so far or seem to be on a path towards sustainability. <laughs> Not there yet. That's something that's coming up for me in all of these different threads. The mosaic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but as as a writer, you've been working uh, quite a lot recently with a number of different people throughout the country. And maybe you could just talk to that, or talk to the Hive Project in Los Angeles, and so you could give us a sure. model of something that's been working for you. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, two two recent projects. One is. Um, the Hive Project, which is coming up this week in Los Angeles, um, tomorrow evening at Silver Lake Library, and also Saturday at Silver Lake Library, and then Friday evening at the Wolf downtown in Santa Fe. Um, there's information on Facebook. I can pass it around through Brian, but um, that is that's kind of a kind of great um, temporary ensemble that has emerged through Padua Playwrights. Um, I lived in LA for six years, and um, actually, to was that Olya talking about um, the how much life you spend in your car? Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 So um, I think one of my keys to happiness in LA was not owning a car. I actually lived there for six years without a car for the most part, and I think that was what kept me sane because I was walking a lot and taking the subway and getting by, and it, it was a different pace, but it was a healthier pace. I think. For me. <laughs> Um, but anyway, the High Project, Casual Playwrights, um, there's sort of been a temporary ensemble that has formed through that project, and we're actually looking a lot at collectivity um, in the plays themselves, um, thinking about bees and the social behaviors of bees and what is happening as the bees are disappearing, um, and how the humans relate to that, the collectivity of humans rely on that. Um, so these kind of interspecies interdependencies for collectivities and what happens when one starts to go away. Um, that's happening this week. Those are lab performances. They're works in progress and they'll continue to grow and come back probably next spring or summer. Um, and then my most recent kind of um, full-length project has been with a, an ensemble here in Minneapolis called Supergroup. And they're uh, kind of largely dance-based, but um, very movement oriented, um, not a specific thread of dance, um, kind of exploratory movement practices. And um, they work with text often, but they've never worked with a collaborating playwright. And um, I was really interested in working with them in part because as a writer, I'm very curious about um, breaking open this idea of story and, and kind of looking at how else we can get at story or get deeper with story than um, only sort of action-based narratives. Um, I'm just curious, you know, what else is under the skin of that. And so working with Supergroup, we were really, movement and text were very much in conversation with each other um, throughout the whole process, and we were letting them inform each other and, um, and all the elements. We were collaborating on all the elements, the visual world of it and the sound and everything. So um, working with them has been awesome. We've worked together about a year, and we're continuing to work together in this next year to make another piece sort of building on the things we develop together. And I can see the appeal of being in an ensemble where you do work with those same people over and over. You know, you can just keep going deeper and deeper. So um, yeah, that's, that's sort of where I'm at. That's lovely. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think I think your, your final sentence, going deeper and deeper, is, is really um, the point of, of, uh, of what we've been doing here over the weekend. And uh, it's just a, a little bit little bit of a of a drop down into something deeper and, and we're going to keep going deeper and deeper throughout throughout our, our our lives and our journeys as human beings but i think that um i i think i'm looking around and i'm seeing a lot of a lot of tired faces and a lot of people that have absorbed a lot of information and shared a lot and gone through some 
Some stuff. <laughs> yeah. <Make> some stuff. <laughs> From the thing to the stuff, you yeah. know? And, like uh, stuff. and so I, I feel like uh, there's there's clearly no wrapping up but around the teapot, there's no there's no sort of summation, and there's no sort of practical solutions. It was really a, a chance for us to all get together and meet and and experience each other through through discourse and through practice as we've done over the weekend. And, and, and unless somebody really feels like they want they want to add or do something, I feel like we, we can just kind of slowly wrap it up. I want to thank you, Anolia. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, so thank you very much. So I think we'll we'll just we'll just end it here then. And thank Rachel for coming and, and Nick and thank Michael you. earlier for joining us. And I do just want to thank HowlRound and HowlRound TV yeah. and the people out there for all the all the work they've done in the creating of the theater commons on the bet on the web at least and uh, allowing us to broadcast. So. And also so. to thank um, Catherine. Absolutely. Who actually really helped us to envision and organize and create this experience um, and giving us so much guidance and ideas and ability to go back and forth and to John Griffin for actually with whom the idea was kind of germinated and leads um, when we met for dinner. Um, the whole weekend has been has been a collaborative effort for Four months in the making, yeah, and, um, and and one that we've been generating and germinating and, and making richer, and it's only you know started to come to life now with with all of you people in the room and all the other people who have joined us over the weekend. So looking forward to uh, to seeing where it goes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you.
gave me paper. You know, and all this shit. I was gonna have to, you know, I was coming out of basement theater in New York. And I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. Let's just do that. And yeah. not worry about it. Because once she gets out, you're doing three jobs while we're eating. You're doing 12 jobs. And then when you guys are going to start, you know, getting to the right time. The framework is just to go. It's all about it. 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 It's all